Your Highness, Secretary General, Your Majesties, Your Royal Highnesses, Presidents, Prime Ministers, Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan for his warm invitation to speak to you at the opening of COP28. Eight years ago, I was most touched to be asked to speak at the opening of COP21 in Paris, which of course culminated in the Paris Agreement, a landmark moment of hope and optimism when nations put differences to one side for the common good. I pray with all my heart that COP28 will be another critical turning point towards genuine transformational action at a time when already, as scientists have been warning for so long, we are seeing alarming tipping points being reached. I've spent a large proportion of my life trying to warn of the existential threats facing us over global warming, over climate change and biodiversity loss. But I was not alone. For instance, Sheikh Mohammed's dear father, Sheikh Zayed, was advocating for clean energy at a time even before the United Arab Emirates as such came into being. All these decades later, and despite all the attention, there is 30% more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now than there was back then, and almost 40% more methane. Some important progress has been made, but it worries me greatly that we remain so dreadfully far off track as the Global Stocktake report demonstrates so graphically. The dangers are no longer distant risks. I've seen across the Commonwealth and beyond countless communities which are unable to withstand repeated shocks, whose lives and livelihoods are laid waste by climate change. Surely, real action is required to stem the growing toll of its most vulnerable victims. Repeated cyclones batter vulnerable island nations like Vanuatu and Dominica. India, Bangladesh and Pakistan have been experiencing unprecedented floods. And East Africa is suffering a decades-long drought. This past summer, common with Spain, Greece, the United States, and many other countries, Canada experienced its most severe wildfire season on record, with 18 and a half million hectares of land burned, causing terrible loss of life and property, and of course, releasing enormous amounts of greenhouse gases that contribute to dangerous feedback loops to which climate scientists have been alerting us for decades. As I've tried to say on many occasions, unless we rapidly repair and restore nature's unique economy based on harmony and balance, which is our ultimate sustainer, our own economy and survivability will be imperiled. Records are now being broken so often that we are perhaps becoming immune to what they are really telling us. When we see the news that this last Northern Hemisphere summer, for instance, was the warmest global average temperature on record, we need to pause to process what this actually means. We are taking the natural world outside balance norms and limits and into dangerous uncharted territory. We are carrying out a vast, frightening experiment of changing every ecological condition all at once at a pace that far outstrips nature's ability to cope. As we work towards a zero carbon 
future, we must work equally towards being nature positive. With what we are witnessing, our choice now is a starker and darker one. How dangerous are we actually prepared to make our world? Dealing with this is a job for us all. Change will come by working together and making it easier to embrace decisions that will sustain our world, rather than carry on as though there are no limits or as though our actions have no consequences. As you gather, ladies and gentlemen, for these critical negotiations, the hope of the world rests on the decisions you must take. I can only encourage you to consider some practical questions which might inform the task ahead of you. Firstly, how can our multilateral organizations, which were established at a different time for different challenges, be strengthened for the crisis we face? How can we bring together our public, private, philanthropic and NGO sectors ever more effectively so that they all play their part in delivering climate action, each complementing the unique strengths of the others? Public finance alone will never be sufficient, but with the private sector firmly at the table and a better, fairer international financial system, combined with the innovative use of risk reduction, tools like first loss risk guarantees, we could mobilize the trillions of dollars we need in the order of four and a half to five trillion a year to drive the transformation we need. Secondly, how can we ensure that finance flows to those developments most essential to a sustainable future and away from practices that make our world more dangerous across every industry in every part of the world? I have, for instance, been heartened by some of the steps taken by parts of the insurance sector, which play such a vital role in incentivizing more sustainable approaches and providing an invaluable source of investment to reduce the risks we face. Thirdly, how can we accelerate innovation and the deployment of renewable energy, of clean technology and other green alternatives to move decisively towards investment in this vital transition across all industries. For instance, how can we increase investments in regenerative agriculture, which can be a nature-positive carbon sink? What incentives are necessary? And how can those which have a perverse impact be eliminated with all due speed? Fourthly, how can we bring together different solutions and initiatives to ensure coherent long-term approaches across sectors, countries, and industries. For virtually every artificial source of greenhouse gas emissions, there are alternatives or mitigations which can be put in place. That is why it is encouraging to see industry transition plans being developed both nationally and globally, which will help each sector of our global economy onto practical pathways to a zero carbon nature positive future. And ladies and gentlemen, fifthly, how can we forge an ambitious new vision for the next 100 years? How can we draw on the extraordinary ingenuity of our societies, the ideas, knowledge, and energy of our young people, our artists, our engineers, our communicators, and importantly, our indigenous peoples to imagine a sustainable future for people everywhere, a future that is in harmony with nature, not set against her. Ladies and gentlemen, in your hands is an unmissable opportunity to keep our common hope alive. I can only urge you to meet it with ambition, imagination, and a true sense of the emergency we face and together with a commitment to the practical action on which our shared future depends. After all, ladies and gentlemen, in 2050, 
our grandchildren won't be asking what we said. They will be living with the consequences of what we did or didn't do. So if we act together to safeguard our precious planet, the welfare of all our people will surely follow. And we need to remember too, that the indigenous worldview teaches us, teaches us that we are all connected, not only as human beings, but with all living things and all that sustains life. As part of this grand and sacred system, harmony with nature must be maintained. The earth does not belong to us. We belong to the earth. Thank you, Your Majesty. And now, please help me welcome to the stage the leader of Brazil and COP30 host nation, His Excellency Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva. Sua Alteza Sheikh Mohammed Bin Zayed, Presidente dos Emirados Árabes, Sua Majestade Rei Carlos III, Senhor Secretário-Geral das Nações Unidas, Excelências, Presidente e Chefe de Estado. Uma mulher africana, a Keniana Vangari Matai, Vencedora do Prêmio Nobel da Paz, sintetizou bem o dilema da humanidade em sua relação com a natureza. Disse ela, a geração que destrói o meio ambiente não é a geração que paga o preço. O painel intergovernamental sobre mudanças climáticas alertou que temos somente até o final desta década para evitar que a temperatura global ultrapasse um grau e meio acima dos níveis pré-industriais. 2023 já é o ano mais quente dos últimos 125 mil anos. A humanidade sofre com secas, enchentes, ondas de calor cada vez mais extremas de frequentes. No norte do Brasil, a Amazônia amarga uma das mais trágicas secas de sua história. No sul, Tempestades de ciclones deixam um rato inédito de destruição. A ciência e a realidade nos mostram que, desta vez, a conta chegou antes. O planeta já não espera para cobrar a próxima geração. O planeta está farto de acordos climáticos não cumpridos, de metas de redução de emissão de carbono negligenciadas do auxílio financeiro aos países pobres que não chega, de discursos eloquentes e vazios. Precisamos de atitudes e práticas concretas. Quantos líderes mundiais estão, de fato, comprometidos em salvar o planeta? Somente no ano passado, o mundo gastou mais de 2 trilhões e 224 milhões de dólares em armas quantias que poderiam ser investidas no combate à fome e no enfrentamento à mudança do clima. Quantas toneladas de carbono são emitidas pelos mísseis que cruzam o céu e desabam sobre civis inocentes, sobretudo crianças e mulheres famintas. A conta da mudança climática não é a mesma para todos e chegou primeiro para as populações mais pobres. O 1% mais rico do planeta emite o mesmo volume de carbono que 66% da população mundial. Trabalhadores do campo que têm suas lavouras de subsistência devastadas pela seca. 
e já não pode alimentar suas famílias. Moradores das periferias das grandes cidades, que perdem o pouco que tem quando a enchente arrasta tudo. Casas, móveis, animais de estimação e seus próprios filhos. A injustiça que penaliza gerações mais jovens é apenas uma das faces das desigualdades que nos aflige. O um mundo naturalizou disparidades inaceitáveis de renda, de gênero e de raça. Não é possível enfrentar a mudança do clima sem combater a desigualdade. Quem passa fome tem sua existência aprisionada na dor do presente e torna-se incapaz de pensar o amanhã. Reduzir vulnerabilidades socioeconômicas significa construir resiliência frente aos eventos extremos. Significa também ter condições de redirecionar esforços para a luta contra o aquecimento global. Em 2009, quando participei da COP15 de Copenhague, a arquitetura da Convenção do Clima estava à beira do colapso. As negociações fracassaram e foi preciso um grande esforço para recuperar a confiança e chegar ao Acordo de Paris em 2015. Ao retornar à presidência do Brasil, constato que estamos hoje em situação semelhante. O não cumprimento dos compromissos assumidos corrói a credibilidade do regime. É preciso resgatar a crença no multilateralismo. É inexplicável que a ONU, apesar de seus esforços, se mostre incapaz de manter a paz simplesmente porque alguns dos seus membros lucram com a guerra. É lamentável que acordos como o protocolo de Kyoto de 1997 ou os acordos de Paris de 2015 não sejam implementados. Governantes não podem ser eximidos de suas responsabilidades. Nenhum país resolverá seus problemas sozinho. Estamos todos obrigados a atuar juntos, além de nossas fronteiras. O Brasil está disposto a liderar pelo exemplo. Ajustamos nossas metas climáticas, que são hoje mais ambiciosas do que as de muitos países desenvolvidos. Reduzimos drasticamente o desmatamento na Amazônia e vamos zerá-lo até 2030. Formulamos um plano de transformação ecológica para promover a industrialização verde, a agricultura de baixo carbono e a bioeconomia. Forjamos uma visão comum com os países amazônicos e criamos pontos com outros países detentores de florestas tropicais. O mundo já está convencido do potencial das energias renováveis. É hora de enfrentar o debate sobre o ritmo lento da descarbonização do planeta e trabalhar por uma economia menos dependente de combustíveis fósseis. Temos de fazê-lo de forma urgente e justa. Vamos trabalhar de forma construtiva com todos os países para pavimentar o caminho nessa COP28 e a COP30 que sediaremos no coração da Amazônia. Não existe dois planetas Terra. Somos uma única espécie chamada humanidade. Todos almejamos tornar o um mundo capaz de acolher com dignidade a totalidade de seus habitantes e não apenas uma minoria privilegiada como nos convida o Papa Francisco na encíclica todos irmãos precisamos conviver na fraternidade muito obrigado Muito obrigada, Presidente Lula. And now, please join me in welcoming the co-founder and environmental director of Brazil's Instituto Zagi, an indigenous youth-led organization dedicated 
to reforestation and preservation of traditional knowledge. Ms. Isabel Prestes da Fonseca. Ali Makem, Utate, Utamentate, eu vos saúdo. Vossas realeza, majestade, senhores e senhoras. Eu sou Isabel Gacrã, uma guardiã, junto com a minha família, da terra indígena Laclanô Choclém, Brasil. Eu estou aqui hoje como uma mulher indígena, como uma mãe uma irmã, um ser humano que vive nessa terra, como vocês e com vocês. Todos os dias eu testemunho o que, tudo que está acontecendo. Com muita tristeza, toda a devastação de no, da nossa floresta, apenas 2% do nosso território sagrado, do nosso bioma, sobrevive hoje. E a árvore, a nossa árvore ancestral, chamada Araucária, com milênios de vida, está à beira da extinção. Nossos antepassados preveram isso, alertaram-nos sobre o futuro e que o mundo precisaria do nosso conhecimento. Hoje, inventamos desequilíbrios ambientais, catástrofes climáticas. Os rios estão secando, as montanhas estão desmoronando e o gelo está derretendo. O planeta aquece pela ação humana. No sul do Brasil, a neve praticamente desapareceu devido à drástica redução da nossa árvore sagrada araucária. Em todos os locais que ainda há neve, a Araucária se faz presente de maneira exclusiva. Nós estamos correndo contra o tempo. Já plantamos milhares de árvores. Não estamos mais apenas protegendo o futuro, mas sim agindo no agora, já. Em nome das vidas indígenas, da floresta e da biodiversidade, Junte-se a nós nessa luta. Nós somos a natureza tentando se defender. Este é um chamado para a ação. Não podemos mais adiar. Unidos, restauraremos a nossa Mãe Terra. Preservaremos o nosso patrimônio e regataremos a harmonia perdida. Nós, do Instituto Zag, não pedimos apenas apoio. Pedimos companheirismo. Convido cada um a unir-se a essa missão e tornar-se parte dessa jornada. Pela regeneração da natureza e da vida. Juntos vamos preservar não apenas um legado, mas o um legado de toda a humanidade. Juntos seremos a mudança. Nós temos a solução para as crises climáticas. Nós somos os guardiões dessa terra. Anglene Utamenta T. Obrigada. Muito obrigada, Miss Prestes da Fonseca. Ladies and gentlemen, we are truly humbled to host you in the United Arab Emirates. May these coming days bring us together in collective action. If we take one thing away from today's ceremony, let it be that we have gathered here from around the world with the same goal, to unite, to act, and to deliver. And so we must. Welcome to the COP of Action. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining.
joining us today. Please remain seated until the heads of state have left the theater. All gold badges holders will be able to exit the theater from the rear of the theater. Kindly follow the ushers. And thank you for joining us today at the World Climate Action Summit at COP28. يرجى من بطاقة لون الأسد التوجه إلى منصة الصورة العادلة. Blue card holders are kindly requested to proceed to the family photo line.
الأحجام من طبقات اللون الأزرق التوجه إلى منصة الصورة العادلة. Blue card holders are happy to accept the receipt to the family for the card. Your Purple card holders are kindly requested to proceed to the family photo platform.
أصحاب السعادة، الضيوف الكرام، السيدات والسادة، 
ندعوكم للجلوس في مقاعدكم حفل الافتتاح على وشك البدء يرجى تحويل أجهزتكم المحمولة إلى الوضع الصامت وشكرا Your Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen We invite you to take your seats as the opening ceremony will be starting shortly Can we please ask you to also to switch your mobile devices to silent? Thank you أصحاب السعادة الضيوف الكرام السيدات والسادة ندعوكم للجلوس في مقاعدكم حفل الافتتاح على وشك البدء يرجى تحويل أجهزتكم المحمولة إلى الوضع الصامت وشكرا Your Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen We invite you to take your seats as the opening ceremony will be starting shortly Can we please ask you to also to switch your mobile devices to silent? Thank you
أصحاب السعادة الضيوف الكرام السيدات والسادة ندعوكم للجلوس في مقاعدكم حفل الافتتاح على وشك البدء يرجى تحويل أجهزتكم المحمولة إلى الوضع الصامت وشكرا Your Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen We invite you to take your seats as the opening ceremony will be starting shortly Can we please ask you to also to switch your mobile devices to silent? Thank you Esteemed guests, for simultaneous translation, kindly tune into the following channels on your devices. For English, Channel 1. For French, Channel 2. Russian, Channel 3. Spanish, Channel 4. Chinese, Channel 5. Arabic, Channel 6. Hindi, Channel 7. And Portuguese, Channel 8.
أصحاب السعادة الضيوف الكرام السيدات والسادة ندعوكم للجلوس في مقاعدكم حفل الافتتاح على وشك البدء يرجى تحويل أجهزتكم المحمولة إلى الوضع الصامت وشكرا Your Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen We invite you to take your seats as the opening ceremony will be starting shortly Can we please ask you to also to switch your mobile devices to silent? Thank you. Your Highnesses, Your Majesties, Your Excellencies, esteemed guests, welcome to the opening ceremony of the World Climate Action Summit at COP28. We are pleased to welcome you to the Al Waha Theatre at Expo City, Dubai. Kindly take your seats. Ashabu Sumu, Ashabu Al Jalala. أصحاب المعالي والسعادة الضيوف الكرام مرحبا بكم في حفل افتتاح القمة العالمية للعمل المناخي في كوب 28 يسعدنا أن نرحب بكم في مسرح الواحة بمدينة أكسبو في دبي يرجى أخذ مقاعدكم
Your Highnesses, Your Majesties, Your Excellencies, esteemed guests, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Khuloud al Atiyat, and welcome to the opening ceremony of the World Climate Action Summit at COP28. What you just saw, the drum rhythms of Ar Ruwah and chants of Al Nadba are the traditional calls to gather from our Shuhuh tribe of the Emirate of Ras Al Khaima. We have heard the call and united, and now we must act. As we come together for a future of sustainable flourishing, it is my great honor to introduce the President of the United Arab Emirates, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan. أصحاب الجلالة والفخامة والسمو أصحاب المعالي والسعادة معالي الأمين العام للأمم المتحدة الحضور الكريم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أرحب بكم جميعا في دولة الإمارات العربية المتحدة وفي مؤتمر كوب 28 وأشكركم على حضور هذه القمة يأتي اجتماعنا اليوم في وقت يواجه فيه العالم تحديات عديدة ومن أهمها تغيير المناخ وانعكاساتها التي تؤثر على جميع جوانب الحياة الحضور الكريم دولة الإمارات لديها سجل حافل في العمل المناخي لقد قمنا على مدى العقود الماضية ببناء قدرات في الطاقة المتجددة النظيفة ووضعنا مساراً وطنياً للوصول إلى الحياد المناخي عام 2050 والتزمنا بخفض الانبعاثات بنسبة 40% بحلول عام 2030 واستثمرنا بما يقارب من 100 مليار دولار وتموين العمل المناخي مع التركيز على الطاقة الجديدة والنظيفة كما نعتزم باستثمار حوالي 130 مليار دولار إضافية في السنوات السبع القادمة إن شاء الله حضورنا الكريم لقد عندما التزمنا باستضافة كاب 28 التزمنا أيضا بجمع العالم لكي نتحد ونعمل وننجز ونعمل على مست... على تسريع انتقال العالم الى النمو الاقتصادي المستدام لطالما كان نقص التموين من اكبر العوائق امام تقدم العمل المناخي العالمي لذلك يسرني الإعلان عن إنشاء صندوق بقيمة 30 مليار دولار
يسرني الإعلان عن إنشاء صندوق بقيمة 30 مليار دولار للحلول المناخية على مستوى العالم والذي تم تصميمه لسد فجوة التمويل المناخي وتيسير الحصول عليه بتكلفة مناسبة كذلك يهدف الصندوق إلى تحفيز جمع واستثمار 250 مليار دولار بحلول عام 2030 حضور الكريم قبل أن أختتم كلمتي اسمحوا لي أن أروي لكم قصة قائد آمن بحب الأرض واحترام الطبيعة وصون مواردها وعمل يد بيد مع شعبة لرعاية هذه الأرض الطيبة مدركاً أن الثروة الحقيقية للدول تكمن في أبنائها وإنجازاتنا اليوم تشهد على عمل بناء مستقبل أكثر إشراقاً إن شاء الله أيها السادة أنه الوالد الشيخ زايد طيب الله ثراه مؤسس الدولة رمز حضارتها وباني نهضتها وصانع ماضيها وحاضرها ومستقبلها شكرا أصحاب الجلالة وأصحاب السمو والفخامة الحضور الكريم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله نحن نرحب بكم جميعا في بلدكم دولة الأمارات ونرحب بالوفود كلها اللي حضرت من أجل مؤتمر المناخ نحمد الله ونشكره على ما أنعم علينا وحبانا بنعمة الأرض حقيقة نحن بالنسبة لنا في دولة الأمارات ما يعتبر موضوع حماية البيئة مجرد شعار بل هو في الواقع جزء لا يتجزأ من تاريخنا وتراثنا وحياتنا كنا ولا زلنا من تزمين بمبدا التعايش بين الانسان والطبيعه عاش ابانا واجدادنا على هذه الارض وتعايشوا مع بيئتها في البر والبحر وادركوا مدى الحاجه للمحافظه عليها 
وان ياخذون منها قدر الحاجه فقط ويتركون فيها ما تلقى فيه الاجيال القادمه مصدر للخير والعطاء والمعيشه ومثل ما عملوا اجدادنا واسلافنا نحن اللي نعيش الان فوق هذه الارض الطيبه مسؤولين عن الاهتمام ببيئتنا وطبيعتنا وواجب علينا واجب الوفاء لاسلافنا واحفادنا اللي من بعدنا على حد سوى بتعيش الاجيال القادمه في عالم يختلف عن عالمنا اللي اعتدنا عليه لهذا علينا ان نعد انفسنا واولادنا للعالم الجديد حمايه بيئتنا والمحافظه عليها في مسؤوليتنا guide them to plenary too so that they do not miss their chance to make their statements so the DLOs please check your record and if your respective head of state head of government that you are looking after is required in plenary two so please swiftly move to plenary two to get us started thank you Excellencies, kindly take your seats, please kindly take your seats so that we can start. If you could be able to take your seats now, I see on the corridor there. If you could take your seats, we'll be able to start immediately. Can you please take your seats? I kindly request that you all take your seats, please.
Your Excellencies, distinguished delegates, honored guests, welcome to the ceremonial opening of the first part of the high-level segment for heads of states and government on the occasion of the 28th session of the Conference of Parties. The 18th session of the Conference of Parties serving as the meeting of the parties to the Kyoto Protocol and the fifth session of the Conference of the Parties serving as the meeting of the parties to the Paris Agreement. Presidents and Prime Ministers, I am deeply humbled and honored to have the opportunity to welcome you today. And allow me to begin by thanking all of you for your presence with us here in the United Arab Emirates. As the largest gathering of world leaders to attend a COP summit, you are collectively demonstrating your real commitment to climate action. Yesterday, on the first day of COP28, we collectively made history. We achieved consensus on a fund for climate impact response that will protect lives and livelihoods, especially the most vulnerable. Your leadership guided this consensus, and I thank you all. I'm very grateful that so many countries have already stepped up and made contributions to the fund. I hope many more will follow. In addition, I was thankful that the COP28 agenda was voted and agreed without any delay. This was also made possible by your support and full engagement. And it allows us to get down to work immediately on the key issues that we must address across the climate agenda. I will do everything in my power to channel the momentum you generate at the summit into an ambitious response to the global stock take and to keep the North Star of 1.5 within reach. Excellencies, I am looking forward to hearing your national statements and commitments, and I count on your continued support to raise climate ambition and to translate those ambitions into real results. Thank you. Excellencies, this afternoon we are honored to have with us His Excellency Mr. Denise Francis, the President of the United Nations General Assembly, and His Excellency Mr. Narendra Modi, Prime Minister of India. Distinguished delegates, it is my pleasure to invite the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Climate Change Secretariat, Mr. Simon Steele, to address the plenary. Simon, you have the floor. Excellencies, ministers, honorable guests, I must begin by thanking the United Arab Emirates for their warm hospitality here in Dubai. Working with your team over the last year to prepare this event has been a pleasure. Looking out at this World Climate Action Summit, it's incredible to see so many leaders convened in one place. The strength of this demonstration of multilateralism is a testament to the scale of the problem we're convened here to address. The UNFCCC was born in 1992, when both the world and this crisis look very different than they do today. But for me, 1992 was the year climate change became real. 
It was the year my father proactively built a sea wall to protect his island home. He'd never heard the concept of climate change, and his neighbors mocked him for how high he built it, how deep the foundations were, and how much of his own money he spent. Today, the ocean is right up against that sturdy wall, pounding it. Its very foundations are exposed. This is why, when some are cynical about the pace or value of COPs, I know, at heart, this process is our only hope to turn the tide. Some of you sitting here before me share my first-hand experience and even more extreme experiences. For others, it's still a mental leap. But let me assure you, the leap becomes much shorter as the impacts lap around you. This isn't about far-flung places. In the hottest year ever, it's at everybody's doorstep, continent by continent, region by region, country by country. None of us are immune. Some leaders here are newly elected. You have the whole term to plan ahead. Some leaders are here nearing the end of your term, more cautiously facing selection cycles. Both governed by the ebbs and flows of your political circumstances. I understand the real politique of your decision making, but the climate crisis transcends these cycles. Empty promises, unfulfilled pledges, abandoned commitments after the photo ops won't help. It won't help the negotiators. It won't help your citizens. It is only by uniting in our fight will we rise to the expectations that COP28 will result in bold commitments. Bold commitments to bend the arch of global warming down from three degrees to 1.5. It's only by uniting in your commitment to doing this together that we'll fully respond to the needs of those affected. And ensure that development and climate action are mutually reinforcing. It's only by focusing on understanding each other that we'll work out how to live in a fossil-free world. It's only by your leadership that we'll be able to use this global stock take to accelerate the action taken thus far. Your political messages must translate into real, tangible action. Action that should be felt in the negotiating rooms. Action translated into the text that's, that's gaveled on December the 12th. My job is simply to facilitate the process and make sure it's as fair, transparent, and just as possible. It's only the political signals you send today and the follow-up actions that can take us to a place beyond the encroaching seas. I thank you. Thank you, Executive Secretary. It is my distinct pleasure to invite His Excellency, Mr. Narendra Modi, Prime Minister of India, to deliver a message to the plenary. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Your Majesties, Your Highnesses, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, 140 crore Bharatiyon ki aur se aap sabhi ko banana vashar. Aaj sabse pahle main aap sabhi ka abhar vyakt karunga. Mere dwara uthaye gaye climate justice, climate finance. और ग्रीन क्रेडिट जैसे विषयों को आपने 
निरंतर समर्थन दिया है हम सभी के प्रयासों से ये विश्वास बढ़ा है कि विश्व कल्याण के लिए सबके हितों की सुरक्षा आवश्यक है सबकी भागीदारी आवश्यक है फ्रेंड्स आज भारत ने इकोलॉजी और इकोनॉमी के उत्तम संतुलन का उदाहरण विश्व के सामने रखा है भारत में विश्व की 17 परसेंट आबादी होने के बावजूद ग्लोबल कार्बन एमिशंस में हमारी हिस्सेदारी ओनली 4 परसेंट से भी कम है भारत विश्व की उन कुछ इकोनॉमीज में से एक है जो एनडीसी टारगेट्स को पूरा करने की राह पर है एमिशन इंटेंसिटी संबंधी टारगेट्स को हमने 11 साल पहले ही हासिल कर लिया है नॉन फोसिल फ्यूअल टारगेट्स को हम निर्धारित समय से 9 साल पहले ही प्राप्त कर चुके हैं और भारत ने इतने पर ही नहीं रुके हैं हमारा लक्ष्य 2030 तक एमिशंस इंटेंसिफाई को 45 परसेंट घटाना है हमने तय किया है कि नॉन फोसिल फ्यूल का शेयर हम बढ़ाकर 50 परसेंट करेंगे और हम 2070 तक नेट जीरो के लक्ष्य की तरफ भी बढ़ते रहेंगे फ्रेंड्स भारत ने अपनी जी ट्वेंटी प्रेसिडेंसी में वन अर्थ वन फैमिली वन फ्यूचर की भावना के साथ क्लाइमेट के विषय को निरंतर महत्व दिया है सस्टेनेबल फ्यूचर के लिए हमने मिलकर ग्रीन डेवलपमेंट पैक पर सहमति बनाई हमने लाइफस्टाइल फॉर सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंट के सिद्धांत तय किए हमने वैश्विक स्तर पर रिन्यूएबल एनर्जी को तीन गुना करने की प्रतिबद्धता जताई भारत ने अल्टरनेट फ्यूल्स के लिए हाइड्रोजन के क्षेत्र को बढ़ावा दिया और ग्लोबल बायोफ्यूल्स अलायंस भी लॉन्च किया हम मिलकर इस नतीजे पर पहुंचे कि क्लाइमेट फाइनेंस कमिटमेंट को बिलियन से बढ़ाकर कई ट्रिलियन तक ले जाने की आवश्यकता है साथियों ग्लासगो में भारत ने आइलैंड स्टेट्स के लिए इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर रेजिलियंट इनिशिएटिव की शुरुआत की थी भारत तेरह देशों में इससे जुड़े प्रोजेक्ट्स तेजी से आगे बढ़ा रहा है ग्लासगो में ही मैंने मिशन लाइफ लाइफ स्टाइल फॉर एनवायरनमेंट का विजन आपके सामने रखा था इंटरनेशनल एनर्जी एजेंसी की स्टडी कहती है कि इस अप्रोच से हम 2030 तक प्रति वर्ष 2 बिलियन टन कार्बन एमिशन कम कर सकते हैं आज मैं इस फॉरम से एक और प्रो प्लेनेट प्रो एक्टिव और पॉजिटिव इनिशिएटिव का आह्वान कर रहा हूं यह है ग्रीन क्रेडिट इनिशिएटिव यह कार्बन क्रेडिट की कॉमर्शियल मानसिकता से आगे बढ़कर जन भागीदारी से कार्बन सिंक बनाने का अभियान है मैं उम्मीद करता हूं कि आप सब इससे जरूर जुड़ेंगे साथियों पिछली शताब्दी की गलतियों को सुधारने के लिए हमारे पास बहुत ज्यादा समय नहीं है मानव जाति के एक छोटे हिस्से ने प्रकृति का 
अंधा धुंध दोहन किया लेकिन इसकी कीमत पूरी मानवता को चुकानी पड़ रही है विशेषकर ग्लोबल साउथ के निवासियों को सिर्फ मेरा भला हो ये सोच दुनिया को एक अंधेरे की तरफ ले जाएगी इस हॉल में बैठा प्रत्येक व्यक्ति प्रत्येक राष्ट्राध्यक्ष बहुत बड़ी जिम्मेदारी के साथ यहां आया है हम में से सभी को अपने दायित्व निभाने ही होंगे पूरी दुनिया आज हमें देख रही है इस धरती का भविष्य हमें देख रहा है हमें सफल होना ही होगा वी हैव टू डू बी टू बी डिसीजिव हमें संकल्प लेना होगा कि हर देश अपने लिए जो क्लाइमेट टारगेट तय कर रहा है जो कमिटमेंट कर रहा है वो पूरा कर कर ही दिखाएगा वी हैव टू वर्क इन यूनिटी हमें संकल्प लेना होगा कि हम मिलकर काम करेंगे एक दूसरे का सहयोग करेंगे साथ देंगे हमें ग्लोबल कार्बन बजट में सभी विकासशील देशों को उचित शेयर देना होगा वी हैव टू बी मोर बैलेंस हमें यह संकल्प लेना होगा कि एडोप्शन मिटिगेशन क्लाइमेट फाइनेंस टेक्नोलॉजी लॉस एंड डैमेज इन सब पर संतुलन बनाते हुए आगे बढ़े वी हैव टू बी एम्बिशियस हमें संकल्प लेना होगा कि एनर्जी ट्रांजिशन जस्ट हो इंक्लूसिव हो इक्विटेबल हो वी हैव टू बी इनोवेटिव हमें यह संकल्प लेना होगा कि इनोवेटिव टेक्नोलॉजी का लगातार विकास करें अपने स्वार्थ से ऊपर उठकर दूसरे देशों को टेक्नोलॉजी ट्रांसफर करें क्लीन एनर्जी सप्लाई चेन को सशक्त करें फ्रेंड भारत यूएन फ्रेमवर्क फॉर क्लाइमेट चेंज प्रोसेस के प्रति प्रतिबद्ध है इसलिए आज मैं इस मंच से 2028 में कोप ट्वेंटी थर्टी में कोप 33 समिट को भारत में होस्ट करने का प्रस्ताव भी रखता हूं मुझे आशा है कि आने वाले 12 दिनों में ग्लोबल स्टॉक टेक की समीक्षा से हमें सुरक्षित और उज्जवल भविष्य का रास्ता मिलेगा कल लॉस एंड डैमेज फंड को ऑपरेशनलाइज करने का जो निर्णय लिया गया है उससे हम सभी की उम्मीद और बड़ी है मुझे विश्वास है वीए की मेजबानी में ये कोप ट्वेंटी एट समिट सफलता की नई ऊंचाई पर पहुंचेगी मैं मेरे ब्रदर हिज हाइनेस शेख मोहम्मद बिन जायद और संयुक्त राष्ट्र संघ के सेक्रेटरी जनरल इज एक्सलेंसी गुरेश को मुझे ये विशेष सम्मान देने के लिए विशेष रूप से आभार व्यक्त करता हूं आप सभी का बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद थैंक यू Thank you your excellency it is now my distinct pleasure to invite his excellency mr denis francis president of the united nations general assembly to address the plenary your excellency you have the floor Your Royal Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan Your Highness Narendra Modi Prime Minister of India Dr Sultan Al Jaber COP28 President esteemed heads of state and government 
Mr. Simon Steele, UNFCC Executive Secretary, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participants. Let me begin by expressing my sincere congratulations to the COP presidency and the government of the United Arab Emirates for the excellent arrangements put in place for the hosting of the UN Climate Conference this year. I am truly grateful for your kind invitation and for the quality of the reception extended to me and my team in the office of president of the UN General Assembly since our arrival. While our world is fraught with global challenges, perhaps none looms as large or as consequential as the climate crisis. The Paris Agreement remains the best answer to the myriad effects of the climate crisis. Living up to the letter and spirit of the Paris Promise is the ultimate goal of our deliberations a goal close to my heart, quite literally so, as I wear and have worn, even predating my assumption of the presidency, a lapel pin advocating the goal of 1.5 degrees. A few weeks ago, it was my privilege to pay a visit to the Cook Islands. There at the Pacific Island Forum leaders with whom I spoke, they spoke agonizingly of the real existence, existential threats posed by sea level rise, itself a direct impact of climate change, but also an indisputable result of our actions, or perhaps more aptly, our inaction. As a citizen of a small island developing state, myself, I am acutely aware that on our current trajectory, those islands and the wealth of culture and history they represent are at peril of imminent disappearance through inundation by the seas. The scenario presented by the UNEP emissions gap report of a three degree world is not science fiction. It is the path we are on. We must change this trajectory. For far too long, leaders across the spectrum have stood at podiums such as this and made grand commitments that capture public opinion, only to be found upon subsequent examination to be either short or totally lacking in implementation. We are long past the time for climate diplomacy through public relations. Action, progressive transformative action is needed now to stabilize atmospheric temperatures and to ensure sustainability of the planet and of human civilization. It is time for a once in a generation change. Pervasive evidence indicates that we have, at least academically, rethought the way we live, the way we produce, and the way we consume on this planet. Curiously, what we have not done is to actually reshape and re-engineer our production systems, our lifestyles and habits, to match the dictates of climate and planetary sustainability. Borrowing from the Secretary General's descriptor about global boiling, the extant situation demands a new, more sustainable, more resilient, more inequitable industrial re revolution. We need a just transition to sustainable energy systems. We need to retrofit for resilience and sustainability. I am convinced that we have both the capacity and the tools at our fingertips to do this while leaving no one behind. Excellencies, 
the energy transition coupled with robust mitigation action is understandably front and center in this effort if we are to halt climate change in its tracks. While the world is moving to renewable sources somewhat faster than anyone might have imagined, significantly more than our feeble efforts are required at scale to produce the desired critical reduction in the levels of emissions. Let us therefore triple renewable energy capacity as the COP28 presidency has challenged us to do. And then let us triple it again. Of course, our high levels of energy dependency impact everything we do, from transport to infrastructure to tourism. And for this reason, I intend to do my part in carrying forward these important sector-specific conversations at the General Assembly of the United Nations. Mindful of this imperative, I am pleased to announce that I will convene the first ever General Assembly Sustainability Week at UN headquarters in New York in April 2024 as a flagship initiative of my presidency. This week will consolidate several high-level, already mandated events promoting sustainability in transport, tourism, and infrastructure sectors. Perhaps most importantly, it will incorporate the global stock take on energy, which aims to complement the stock take here at COP28. The results of Sustainability Week will, I hope, add further momentum to the path laid out at COP28 and ahead of the 2024 Summit of the Future next September. I look forward to welcoming delegations at the highest possible level to New York in April in pursuance of sustainability. Excellencies, while we work towards fast-track energy transition, we must reconcile the reality that climate impacts are here already and will only intensify as we continue the march towards the 1.5 degrees. It is absolutely essential, therefore, that we deliver meaningful progress in specific relation to adaptation. Clearly, we need to show up financing for ad adaptation. More accessible, more available, and more affordable financing from the international financial institutions must be unlocked. On this point, there is hope, and I welcome the capitalization of the Fund for Loss and Damage. Developing countries deserve no less. I make the plea, let us continue to build on this success. Let this be just the beginning. From building seawalls to designing drought resistant crops, developing countries must receive the necessary financial and technical support for climate adaptation. And I applaud the efforts of partners to make community grants and financing more available and quickly accessible, as such funding is particularly important for small island developing states and marginalized communities on the front lines of climate change, as well as for vulnerable groups, especially women and girls. Such resources can help facilitate, facilitate global and local early warning systems, as well as data and information services to better address extreme climate events. We need to not only be risk informed, but also resilient at every level and across all stakeholders, thus leaving no one behind. Esteemed heads of state and government, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am not just optimistic, 
I am convinced that we can emerge from Dubai with a triumvirate of undertakings, a threefold surge in renewable energy, a financial influx to propel sustainability, and a fortified support system for those confronting climate-induced vulnerabilities. Our collective resolve must echo louder than the challenges we face. Together, we can make COP28 a decisive win for our people, for our communities, and for our planet. The actions we take here will resonate for generations, proving that when nations and people unite in a common quest for peace, progress, prosperity, and sustainability for all, we can surmount any obstacle and create the future we want. Let's get it done. I thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Your Excellencies, distinguished delegates, this brings us to the end of the ceremonial opening of the high-level segment. Allow me to please ask you all to remain in your seats to allow our guests to leave the podium before we begin the delivery of national statements. Your Excellencies, distinguished delegates, honorable guests, I now declare open joint second meeting of COP28, CMP18, and CMA5. Today, heads of state and government will deliver their respective national statement. I'd like to inform you, Your Excellencies, of actions in place to ensure effective time management. There is a three-minute time limit for statements during the high-level segment. Statements should be as concise as possible, noting the full texts of the official statements will be made available on the UNFCCC website. And finally, please note that heads of state or government who are not in the plenary at the time for delivery of their statements will be scheduled to speak at the end of all statements of the same category. Your Excellencies, distinguished delegates, honorable guests, the United Arab Emirates is delighted to welcome over 170 heads of states and government. Your presence here today is a testament to the milestone nature of this COP to raise our shared ambition over this critical decade to keep 1.5 within reach. Success is underpinned by your commitment to take meaningful and tangible steps to address the climate crisis by implementing and achieving the long-term goals of the Paris Agreement and the ultimate objective of the Convention. It is essential that we expedite efforts towards implementing climate action. With political will and commitment, we can and must deliver an outcome in the United Arab Emirates that will allow for all of us to be proud of. Allow me now to ask everyone to get ready for us to begin. It is my pleasure to welcome His Excellency Mr. Abdel Fattah Assisi, President of Egypt, your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Akhi sahib al-Sumu, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed al-Dahyan, 
رئيس دولة الإمارات العربية المتحدة الشقيق السادة رؤساء الدول والحكومات أصحاب المعالي الوزراء السيدات والسادة يسعدني أن أستهل كلمتي بتهنئة دولة الإمارات الشقيقة على توليها رئاسة مؤتمر الأطراف الثامن والعشرين لاتفاقية الأمم المتحدة الإطارية لتغير المناخ كاب 28 مشيدا بحسن التنظيم ومؤكدا ثقة الكاملة بقدرة دولة الإمارات على الإسهام الفاعل في تحقيق أهداف هذه الدورة إن مؤتمرنا اليوم ينعقد وعلى غرار مؤتمر شرم الشيخ العام الماضي وسط تحديات سياسية ودولية خطيرة لا تقل أهمية عن تداعيات التغيرات المناخية وهو ما يتطلب منا كقيادات سياسية مسؤولة أمام شعوبها العمل المقلص على خروج مؤتمرنا هذا بنتائج طموحة وتنفيذ متسارع للتعهدات السابقة وتدرك مصر في ضوء دراستها للمؤتمر الماضي بشرم الشيخ وتأثرها المباشر بالتغيرات المناخية ضرورة تعزيز العمل الجماعي والعاجل للتعامل مع تحدي تغير المناخ بما يعزز قدرتنا على ضمان التنمية المتوافقة مع البيئة التي تحفظ كوكب الأرض للأجيال المستقبلية وتتعامل مع ما تشهده الأجيال الحالية من آثار مناخية شديدة وكوارث تتجاوز قدرة الدول خاصة النمية منها على التكيف معها أو احتواء آثارها على مختلف قطاعات التنمية السادة الحضور إن مسؤولياتنا كقادة المجتمعين اليوم هي تأكيد الرسالة الواضحة بأننا ملتزمون بل وتبوحون في إجراءاتنا وفي تنفيذها بما يتفق مع ما توافقنا عليه في باريس سواء ما يتعلق بالتجاوب مع التوصيات العلمية أو الالتزام بالمسؤوليات والتعهدات وفقا لقدرات كل دولة وحجم مسؤولياتها التاريخية والحالية عن التحديات المناخية الجارية لذا فمن المهم تأكيد مبادئ الإنصاف والانتقال العادل والمسؤوليات المشتركة متباينة الأعباء باعتبارها مبادئ أساسية في الإطار متعدد الأطراف ولقد حرصنا في شرم الشيخ على إطلاق العديد من المسارات التي تسهم في تحقيق تطلعاتنا في هذا الصدد وعلى رأسها إنشاء صندوق تمويل الدول النامية لمواجهة الخسائر والأضرار المناخية وبرنامج العمل حول الانتقال العادل وبرنامج عمل لخفض الانبعاثات كما مهدنا الطريق أمام التوصل إلى هدف عالمي للتكيف مع التغيرات المناخية في هذا الإطار اسمحوا لي أن أعرب عن تقدير لكم جميعا في ضوء ما شاهدناه خلال هذا العام من نتائج سواء ما يتعلق بالنقاشات حول الانتقال العادل أو تفعيل برنامج عمل خفض الانبعاثات في قطاعي الطاقة والنقل فضلا عن التوصل إلى توصيات لتفعيل ترتيبات تمويل الدول النامية في مواجهة الخسائر والأضرار المناخية وتفعيل صندوق التمويل ذي الصلة إلا أن نجاح هذه الجهود يرتكن إلى توافر التمويل المناسب سواء من حيث أدواته وألياته أو مصادره وحجمه وتيسير النفاذ إليه ويقودنا هذا إلى ضرورة سيارة رؤية مشتركة تتضمن توصيات متفقا عليها حول تطوير كافة عناصر المنظومة من مؤسسات وسياسات تمويل أو مؤسسات تقييم أو قطاع خاص السيدات والسادة إننا نؤمن بأن تحقيق هذه الأهداف هو أمر ممكن إذا عملنا معا بروح التعاون والمشاركة ولذلك ندعو المجتمع الدولي إلى اتخاذ خطوات أكثر طموحا في مؤتمر دبي إضافة إلى توسيع نطاق المشاركة المجتمعية مع تفادي الأفعال الأحادية التي تراعي التي لا تراعي سوى المصالح الضيقة وأنني أتطلع لأن نخرج من مؤتمرنا هذا بإطار دولي معزز لتطوير التعاون وتوجيه الدعم المالي والتقني المطلوب للدول النامية وفي الختام وجدد تأكيد التزام مصر بمواجهة تحدي تغير المناخ ووجه نداء عالميا لجميع الأطراف بتقديم الدعم الكامل والمخلص 
لدولة الإمارات الشقيقة إذا ما خروج مؤتمر دبي بنتائج تاريخية تؤكد لجميع شعوب العالم إننا عازمون بل وقادرون بإذن الله على إنقاذ وحماية كوكب الأرض موطن حياتنا ومستقبل أبنائنا وأحفادنا جيلا بعد جيل شكرا جزيلا لحسن انتباهكم شكرا جزيلا Thank you very much, Your Excellency. It is now my pleasure to welcome His Majesty King Abdullah bin Hussein, King of Jordan. Your Majesty, you have the floor. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Aqi sahib al-Sumu wa Sheikh Muhammad bin Zayed al Nahyan. Mr. Secretary General, Mr. President, at the wajah fi al-bidaya bi shukr wa taqdeer bi akhi sahib al-sumu wa Sheikh Muhammad bin Zayed wa dawlati al-ibarat al-arabiyati al-muttahida al-shakiqa ala husn al-tanzim bi hadihi al-qimati al-dawliya. My friends, this year's conference of the parties must recognize even more than ever that we cannot talk about climate change in isolation from the humanitarian tragedies unfolding around us. As we speak, the Palestinian people are facing an immediate threat to their lives and well-being. In Gaza, over 1.7 million Palestinians have been displaced from their homes. Tens of thousands have been injured or killed in a region already on the front lines of climate change, the massive destruction of war makes the environmental threats of water scarcity and food insecurity even more severe. In Gaza, where people are living with little clean water and the bare minimum of food supplies, climate threats magnify the devastation of war. So my friends, as we meet here today to talk about inclusivity in climate response, let's be inclusive of the most vulnerable. Palestinians severely impacted by the war on Gaza, populations around the world affected by conflict and poverty, and refugee families and host communities in our region and beyond. To address the real dangers of food insecurity in Gaza, Jordan has brought together all international partners to coordinate on mechanisms for the sustainable provision of food supplies to the Strip. And as a country where refugees make up over a third of our population, we launched the Climate Refugee Nexus last year. This global initiative prioritizes, prioritizes climate-related support and investments for refugee-hosting nations. We are truly grateful for the 58 countries that have supported this initiative so far. But much more needs to be done. My friends, Jordan contributes a slim 0.06% to global greenhouse gases, yet we are greatly impacted by global climate change, which has caused threats to our scarce water resources, food sources, and eco-diversity. Today, Jordan's most ambitious and vital projects relate to water. A major national water project envisions desalinating Red Sea water from the Gulf of Aqaba and challenging it to major population areas. The National Water Conveyance Project we rely on renewable energy, a field where we have made significant strides. Our national energy strategy aims to generate 31% of electricity from renewables by 2030. Hybrid and electric vehicles represent 18% of our transport system. In other climate action, research at the Aqaba Marine Park will explore the unique resilience of the Red Sea's coral reefs to benefit the conservation and regeneration of coral reefs around the world. 
and I look forward to attending an event tomorrow on board the Ocean Explorer vessel to highlight this initiative. Nationally, with a strong talent pool of young entrepreneurs and qualified engineers, we are pressing forward with solutions in climate smart agriculture, water conservation, clean energy innovations, and more. And some of our innovators are showcasing their work here at COP28. Jordan also launched its Green Family Alliance strategy, the first in the region, and we issued our first green bond earlier this year. So my friends, despite the challenges, Jordan has set an example in the region as a climate action pioneer and is emerging as a green tech hub. Yet just as the impact of climate change does not take place in a vacuum, no country's response succeeds alone. The global stock take has shown us that our world is still far behind in achieving the goals set by the Paris Agreement. As we work to catch up on the lost time and progress, we cannot forget the most vulnerable. Conflict-ridden communities, refugees and developing countries must not be left alone to face a global problem. Nor can we stand by as the massive destruction of a relentless war in Gaza threatens more people and holds back progress towards a better global future. Current and future generations will hold us all accountable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Majesty. It is now my pleasure to welcome His Majesty King Tupu VI, King of Tonga. Your Majesty, you have the floor. Your Highness, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, President of the United Arab Emirates. Your Majesties, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to add my congratulations to the government and people of the United Arab Emirates for hosting COP28. Congratulations for a brilliant celebration to kick off the conference, coinciding with the UAE National Day at the human-centric city of the future. The warm welcome and gracious hospitality extended to us has been splendid. Mr. President, it's painful for the people of the small island developing states to see that COP28 may not be the milestone moment we had all been hoping for because of our slow progress on the Paris Agreement. The far-reaching impacts of climate change and disasters on human security and mobility displaces more than 50,000 Pacific people every year. At the 52nd Pacific Islands Forum last month, leaders endorsed the Pacific Partnership for Prosperity as a political prioritization process to mobilize resources to empower Pacific people to bring about transformational change through national and regional development. We need a Pacific-led, member-owned, and managed community resilience financing facility. We recognize Australia and New Zealand's commitments, and I therefore strongly urge all partners to contribute to funding the establishment of a Pacific Resilience Facility. We are ocean people. The ocean is our lifeblood. It feeds us. It is our mode of transportation and part of our deep-seated culture, making COP28 and the themes outlined by UAE right in line with major gaps and challenges that Tonga and small island development states are experiencing in the areas of technology, innovation, inclusion, frontline communities, and finance. A 2050 strategy for a blue Pacific continent sees Pacific Island countries embarking on a blue technological revolution with innovation at the center, seeking to develop and deploy SIDS appropriate technologies and looking at ways to improve climate resilience of the majority of the Tongan population. Tonga and Palau are champions of unlocking the Blue Pacific Prosperity Plan, which articulates the goals of 100% effective ocean management for the region, 
and 30% protection of the Blue Pacific continent. Align to Pacific country contexts, priorities and capacities. Robust food systems underpinned by resilient ecosystems resulting in healthy and productive Pacific people and fit for purpose, sustainable financing mechanisms that support the implementation of the 2050 strategy. The ambitious agenda before us focuses on four paradigm shifts to guide our work under neg negotiating mandates and the President's action agenda. But I believe that we can make major progress by placing one of those important shifts at the forefront of our debate, Mr. President. Let us put nature, people, lives, and livelihoods at the heart of climate action. Thank you. Thank you, Your Majesty. It is my pleasure to welcome His Majesty Sultan Haji Hassanullah Bilqay, Sultan of Brunei. Your Majesty, you have the floor. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. His Excellency, President of COP28, Honorable Heads of State and Government, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, I wish to express my sincere appreciation to His Highness. Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, President of the United Arab Emirates, the government and the people of the UAE for hosting this summit. Excellency, climate change has emerged as our generation's most urgent challenge, threatening our existence. Unfortunately, initial results from the first global stock take have revealed that we are not on track to limit gold's temperature rise not beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius and to prevent a global disaster. This underscores the need for a renewed sense of urgency to fulfill our Paris Agreement obligation. It also demands that developed countries honor past commitments and provide adequate resources and affordable technology to combat the impact of climate change. Despite accounting for a mere 0.017% of global emission, Brunei Darussalam takes serious heed to this call for action. We are committed to balancing national development and environmental protection while pursuing sustainable growth for our economy. We have also maintained over half of our land area in pristine natural rainforest with our mangrove ranks third largest in Borneo. In addition, we aim to plant a half a million permanent trees by 2035, expanding our carbon sink further. Through our climate change policy, we are actively diversifying our energy mix by emphasizing our renewable, collaborating with all stock stakeholders, including youth and the private sector. We are on track to achieve a 20% re reduction 
in emission by 2030, as outlined in our NDC, paving the way to achieving net zero by 2050. Two years ago, Brunei Darussalam took the lead in elevating a climate action at the regional level. This is why we will be hosting the ASEAN Centre for Climate Change. It will facilitate enhanced climate change mitigation and adapting adaptation efforts across Southeast Asia through research, analysis, data exchange, and policy recommendations. Therefore, we welcome support and cooperation from all interested member states and international organizations to make this center meaningfully contribute regionally and to our global efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Your Excellency, the COP President, Your Highness, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, fellow leaders, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Syed El Nahyan, UN Secretary General, fellow leaders, as we convene here in Dubai, we must appreciate that the presence of almost 200 nations speaks volumes about the magnitude of this global event and what it stands for. This gathering is a testament to the universal recognition that among the multitude of global challenges confronting us today, climate change stands out as by far the defining issue of our era. COP28 underscores our shared commitment to confront with unwavering resolve a challenge that transcends borders impacts every facet of human existence and well-being and demands a concerted global response as a matter of grave urgency. The reality before us is irrefutable. According to the latest UN data, unless there is a significant and radical shift in our economic and industrial patterns, we are hurtling at a perilous velocity on a trajectory towards the dire scenario of a world that is warmer by three degrees Celsius. The evidence is alarming. In just the last, in just the first 10 months of this year, we experienced 86 days where temperatures soared over 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. Adding to this worrying scenario is the fact that global greenhouse gas emissions have not decreased, but rather increased by a deeply worrying 1.2 percent between 2021 and 2022, culminating in a staggering 57.4 gigatons of CO2 equivalent, a record high that underscores the magnitude of the climate crisis we face. We must add that all the increases were experienced in the G20 countries, and many of them are here and they are listening. This crisis must never be seen as a distant threat. It is here now indiscriminately devastating nations, regardless of their size or wealth, thereby reshaping our world in a profound, unprecedented, and highly complicated ways. A stark illustration of this disastrous turn of events is currently unfolding in Eastern Africa, where catastrophic flooding has swiftly followed 
the most severe drought the region has seen in over 40 years. Scientific evidence clearly and strongly links these extreme weather events to human-induced climate change. Studies indicate that droughts are now at least 100 times more likely in parts of Africa than they were in pre-industrial era. This translates into a dramatic reduction in long-term rainfall, while short-term rainfall patterns remain erratic and unpredictable. All of us are already living in this dire reality. Kenya has been besieged by relentless torrents that have claimed lives and displaced countless communities. The ensuing injury, loss and damage extends beyond immense human toll to the destruction of vital infrastructure and the disruption of critical supply chains across many vital sectors. Beyond mere logistical challenges, the devastation further complicates the daily struggle for survival for many households and communities. The situation in our Horn of Africa region, in many other developing countries, lay bare the harsh reality of climate change. It is a poignant reminder of its disproportionate impact and a call to action for all of us to mobilize rapidly to address this imbalance with urgency, solidarity, and inclusivity. We are also here because we are convinced of our collective ability to effect change. Our mission for this COP is clear, to foster radical cooperation that steers the world firmly back onto a 1.5 degrees Celsius ceiling. Equally critical, we are here to affirm our commitment to provide robust support to those of us who have contributed least to climate change, yet bear its most catastrophic impacts. As Africa, we are ready to play our part in full. The Nairobi Declaration, which we adopted at the conclusion of the first Africa Climate Summit, set out the vision and pathway for Africa to be a vital part of the global solution to the existential climate challenge we face. The declaration captures the consensus of the African government leaders for climate positive growth that harnesses our humble human natural resources. It commits us to triple renewable energy capacity, establish green manufacturing, halt and reverse deforestation, promote sustainable agriculture, promote nature-based solutions, support the global coal to face down coal plants and eliminate inefficient fossil fuel production subsidies and further amplify calls for a new global financial architecture and global carbon tax. In Kenya, we have transformed this vision into tangible calls. Our plan is ambitious to expand our current energy capacity of approximately three gigawatts to 100 gigawatts of entirely renewable power by 2050 as a cornerstone of our green industrialization strategy. This level of ambition must be matched by the global commitment to achieve concrete action-oriented outcomes. The first global stock take at, the COP, at this COP is not just a checkpoint. It is a crucial step forward in our collective res response to climate change. It must therefore encompass strategies for mitigation, adaptation, addressing loss and damage, and fundamentally, the means of its implementation. Such a comprehensive approach will pave the way for a more inclusive and robust set of nationally determined contributions in the next cycle. At the heart of our discussion, at this COP28 must be a package of ambitious energy transition and investment goals and incentives aligned with our commitment to maintain a global temperatures within 1.5 degree limit. This, entail a, this entails a pledge to triple renewable energy capacity and double energy efficiency by 2030, alongside a significant reduction in fossil fuel dependency. I commend my brother, the COP presidency, for their efforts to converge the world around this global core. The strong participation of traditional hydrocarbon energy leaders in this global endeavor 
has transformed the conversation and brought us closer to consensus based on democratic inclusion and the best spirit of collective action, as well as multilateralism. Notably, the fusion demands the liberate support for developing countries. In the past two decades, only 2% of the $3 trillion invested globally in renewable energy has reached Africa, despite the continent's vast resource endowments and great need for investment. The consequences of this investment gap are starkly evident. More than 600 million Africans are deprived of basic energy services, which are fundamental to dignified living and access to essential services such as healthcare and education. The challenge is compounded by the fact that nearly one billion people in Africa do not have access to clean cooking amenities. A tendency to ignore Africa's developmental and industrialization needs and the failure to invest in our burgeoning young generation is no longer a tenable proposition. We cannot afford to neglect the immense potential or ignore the pressing needs of a continent on the cusp of transformative growth. Turning Africa into a green powerhouse is not just essential for the continent, it is also vital for global industrialization decarbonization. Going forward, clear, actionable roadmaps for implementations are required. In turn, this call for a unified global effort to mobilize the necessary capital for both development and climate action. To echo the consensus projected at the Paris summit, we must establish a global, a new global financing pact, which ensures that no country is ever forced to choose between its development aspirations and necessary climate action. Fundamentally, this is a call for an integrated approach where economic growth and developmental sustainability are not mutually exclusive, but are pursued in tandem for the greater global good. Finally, the urgency and magnitude of our task uh, calls for far greater transformation than the incremental progress we have seen over the past 30 years. We need to execute quantum leaps in terms of both our strategic actions and, te and technological innovation. What lies at stake is more than just a climate issue. It is a matter of guaranteeing dignified living and livelihoods for billions who lack basic necessities. Our response must match the scale of this global challenge with boldness and innovation. Given this context, the long-standing adversarial dynamic between Global North and Global South proves practically counterproductive. This division has hindered our ability to unite and leverage our collective strengths and robbed us of tremendous opportunities. Yet, in the face of a threat that endangers the health of our planet and our very existence, we must find in collective action a force that neutralizes and transcends these divisions. Climate change does not respect artificial distinctions, traditional boundaries, or old antagonisms. Instead, it should unite us against a shared borderless challenge. Consequently, our approach must be collaborative, inclusive, and anchored in justice. This means making decisions that prioritize the well-being of every person while acknowledging that climate action is inextricably linked to social justice and equity. In this room, ladies and gentlemen, we have the power, the means, and most of all, the responsibility to act. The world is watching, and what we deliver at COP28 will be a testament of whether we are capable guardians of this planet and competent stewards of its stability. COP28 and the global stock take are elements of a strong and clear call to conscience on behalf of the global community. Let us, not, let us not be satisfied with another minimal increment, but rather let us make this COP a turning point 
towards a just, equal world of opportunity safe from the looming threat of a climate disaster. I thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you, Your Excellency. It is now my pleasure to welcome His Excellency, Mr. Shavgat Mirziyoyev, President of Uzbekistan. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Hurmatli delegatsiya rahbarlari, bugungi tarixiy sammitga taklif etilganimiz hamda Anjumanning yuqori darajada tashkil qilingani uchun Birlashgan Arab Amirligi prezidenti Muhammad bin Zayed Al Nahyan Allah hazratlariga bildirilgan samimiy minnatdorchilik so'zlariga qo'shilaman. Biz amirlikning iqlim o'zgarishiga qarshi kurashda global tashabbuslari va yashil taraqqiyotga qo'shayotgan katta hissasini olqishlaymiz. Fursatdan foydalanib Birlashgan Arab Amirliklari xalqining milliy bayrami bilan chin dildan qutlayman. Hurmatli sammit ishtirokchilari, iqlim muammolari barqaror rivojlanish yo'lida eng asosiy tahdidga aylanib ulgurdi. Bu xavf xatarlar hatto dunyo geosiyosi arxitekturasiga ham ta'sir ko'rsatmoqda. Iqlim o'zgarishining salbiy oqibatlari Orol fojiyasi tufayli Markaziy Osiyoda ayniqsa jiddiy sezilmoqda. Mintaqamizda havo haroratining oshishi jahondagi o'rtacha ko'rsatishdan ikki baravar ko'pdir. Favqulodda issiq kunlar soni 2 martda ortdi. Muzliklar maydonining uchdan bir qismi yo'qoldi. Tuproq yemirilishi jarayonlari 30 million aholi turmush tarziga salbiy ta'sir ko'rsatmoqda. Kuchli chang va qum bo'ronlari odatiy holga aylandi. Ichimlik suvi taqchilligi, havo ifloslanishi, biyoxilmaxillik yo'qolishi qishloq xo'jaligi, hosildorligi pasayishi kabi muammolar tobora avj olmoqda. Bu global xavflar keng mintaqamizda xatarli nuqtaga yetib kelmoqda. Hurmatli anjuman qatnashchilari, yashil iqtisodiyotga o'tish va uglerod neytralligiga erishish yangi O'zbekistonning ustuvor strategik vazifasidir. So'nggi yillarda yurtimizda muqobil energiya ulushi ikki baravarga ko'paydi. Biz 2030-yilga borib 25 gigavat qayta tiklanuvchi energiya quvvatlarini barpo etamiz. Yashil vodorod ishlab chiqarish bo'yicha ilk amaliy qadamlarni tashladik. Yashil makon tashabbusi doirasida mamlakatimizda 1 milliard tub ko'chat ekilmoqda. Orol dengizining qurigan tubida 2 million gektar maydonda o'rmonlar barpo etdik. Biz iqlim o'zgarishiga qarshi faqat birdamlik va keng xalqaro hamkorlik orqali samarali kurashishimiz mumkin. Bu borada quyidagi takliflarni ilgari surmoqchiman. Birinchidan, Paris shartnomasi doirasida iqlim o'zgarishiga moslashish sohasida global xatli mexanizmni tezroq kelishishi tarafdorimiz. Biz Markaziy Osiyo iqlim muloqoti platformasida adaptatsiya strategiyasini ishlab chiqmoqdamiz. Kecha yuqotish va zararlar jamg'armasini tashkil etish bo'yicha qabul qilingan muhim qarorni yuksak baholaymiz. Ikkinchidan, global miqyosda kam uglerodli iqtisodiyotga o'tish adolatli, shaffof va inklyuziv bo'lishi shart. Bunda rivojlanayotgan davlatlarning manfaatlari albatta inobatga olinishi juda muhim. Bu muammo katta yetilik va yigirmalik formatlarda doimiy ko'rib chiqilishi maqsadga muvofiqdir. Uchinchidan, biz Birlashgan Millatlar Tashkilotining rezolyutsiyasi asosida Orol bo'yi hududining ekologik ofat zonasidan innovatsiyalar, texnologiyalar va yangi imkoniyatlar mintaqasiga aylantirmoqchimiz. Bu yerda iqlim texnologiyalari xalqaro 
Expo Hub'ını yaratışta yakın hamkarlıkını taklif etmemiz. Dördüncüden, iklim uzgarışıya karşı kuraşta ilim fan yutuklarından keng faydalanışımız lazım. Taşkent'daki Yaşıl Üniversitet Negizi'de iklim ilmi forumu da davulatlarınız yetakçı alım ve ekspertlerini iştirak etişine çakraman. Yer degradatsası, sudan faydalanış, azıq avukat hafsiligi muammaları forum kun tartıbıdan çay aladı deyip işanaman. Beşinciden, Birleşken Milletler Tashkilatı bilen 2024 yılda Uzbekistan'da iklim migratsası konferensiyasını otkazış niyatta biz. Kalkara Mekhnat Tashkilatı bilen yaşıl bantlik dasturunu işler çıkış ve modellaştırış markazını tashkil etiş taklif kılaman. Kop Yaşlar Konferensiyasını mamlakatımızda yukarı derecede tashkil etişke tayyormuz. Hürmetli dostlar, Uzbekistan iklim uzgarışge karşı kuraş boyunca umum başarı gayelerge daima sadıqdır. Bu ezgü masatta kelgüsü yılı Samarkan Halkara İklim Forumunu utkazış ve Birleşken Milletler Tashkilatının Allah'ıda rezolüsiyasını kabul kılış taşabusunu kullab kuvvetleşke çakraman. Şançım Kamil, bugünkü samitimiz sayaramızın yana da barqarar, paravan ve hafsız geleceğini tamirleş yolu da dost halklarımızı yakınlandırışke kızmak kıladı. Etibariniz için rahmet. Ladies and gentlemen, 140 crore bharatiyon ki or se aap sabhi ko mera namaskar. Aaj sabse pahle mein aap sabhi ka abhar vyakta karunga. Mere dwara uthaye gaye climate justice, climate finance aur green credit jaise vishayon ko aapne निरंतर समर्थन दिया है हम सभी के प्रयासों से यह विश्वास बढ़ा है कि विश्व कल्याण के लिए सबके हितों की सुरक्षा आवश्यक है सबकी भागीदारी आवश्यक है फ्रेंड्स आज भारत ने इकोलॉजी और इकोनॉमी के उत्तम संतुलन का उदाहरण विश्व के सामने रखा है भारत में विश्व की 17% आबादी होने के बावजूद ग्लोबल कार्बन एमिशंस में हमारी हिस्सेदारी ओनली 4% से भी कम है भारत विश्व की उन कुछ इकोनॉमीज में से एक है जो एनडीसी टारगेट्स को पूरा करने की राह पर है एमिशंस इंटेंसिटी संबंधी टारगेट्स को हमने 11 साल पहले ही हासिल कर लिया है नॉन फोसिल फ्यूल टारगेट्स को हम निर्धारित समय से 9 साल पहले ही प्राप्त कर चुके हैं और भारत ने इतने पर ही नहीं रुके हैं हमारा लक्ष्य 2030 तक एमिशंस इंटेंसिफाई को 45% घटाना है हमने तय किया है कि नॉन फोसिल फ्यूल का शेयर हम बढ़ाकर 50% करेंगे और हम 2070 तक नेट जीरो के लक्ष्य की तरफ भी बढ़ते रहेंगे फ्रेंड्स भारत ने अपनी G20 प्रेसिडेंसी में वन अर्थ वन फैमिली वन फ्यूचर की भावना के साथ क्लाइमेट के विषय को निरंतर महत्व दिया है सस्टेनेबल फ्यूचर के लिए हमने मिलकर ग्रीन डेवलपमेंट पैक पर सहमति बनाई हमने लाइफस्टाइल फॉर सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंट के सिद्धांत तय किए हमने वैश्विक स्तर पर 
रिन्यूएबल एनर्जी को तीन गुना करने की प्रतिबद्धता जताई भारत ने अल्टरनेट फ्यूल्स के लिए हाइड्रोजन के क्षेत्र को बढ़ावा दिया और ग्लोबल बायोफ्यूल्स अलायंस भी लॉन्च किया हम मिलकर इस नतीजे पर पहुंचे कि क्लाइमेट फाइनेंस कमिटमेंट को बिलियन से बढ़ाकर कई ट्रिलियन तक ले जाने की आवश्यकता है साथियों ग्लासगो में भारत ने आइलैंड स्टेट्स के लिए इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर रेजिलियंट इनिशिएटिव की शुरुआत की थी भारत तेरह देशों में इससे जुड़े प्रोजेक्ट्स तेजी से आगे बढ़ा रहा है ग्लासगो में ही मैंने मिशन लाइफ लाइफ स्टाइल फॉर एनवायरनमेंट का विजन आपके सामने रखा था इंटरनेशनल एनर्जी एजेंसी की स्टडी कहती है कि इस अप्रोच से हम 2030 तक प्रति वर्ष 2 बिलियन टन कार्बन एमिशन कम कर सकते हैं आज मैं इस फॉर्म से एक और प्रो प्लेनेट प्रो एक्टिव और पॉजिटिव इनिशिएटिव का आह्वान कर रहा हूं यह है ग्रीन क्रेडिट इनिशिएटिव यह कार्बन क्रेडिट की कॉमर्शियल मानसिकता से आगे बढ़कर जन भागीदारी से कार्बन सिंक बनाने का अभियान है मैं उम्मीद करता हूं कि आप सब इससे जरूर जुड़ेंगे साथियों पिछली शताब्दी की गलतियों को सुधारने के लिए हमारे पास बहुत ज्यादा समय नहीं है मानव जाति के एक छोटे हिस्से ने प्रकृति का अंधा धुंध दोहन किया लेकिन इसकी कीमत पूरी मानवता को चुकानी पड़ रही है विशेषकर ग्लोबल साउथ के निवासियों को सिर्फ मेरा भला हो ये सोच दुनिया को एक अंधेरे की तरफ ले जाएगी इस हॉल में बैठा प्रत्येक व्यक्ति प्रत्येक राष्ट्राध्यक्ष बहुत बड़ी जिम्मेदारी के साथ यहां आया है हम में से सभी को अपने दायित्व निभाने ही होंगे पूरी दुनिया आज हमें देख रही है इस धरती का भविष्य हमें देख रहा है हमें सफल होना ही होगा वी हैव टू डू बी टू बी डिसीजिव हमें संकल्प लेना होगा कि हर देश अपने लिए जो क्लाइमेट टारगेट तय कर रहा है जो कमिटमेंट कर रहा है वो पूरा कर कर ही दिखाएगा वी हैव टू वर्क इन यूनिटी हमें संकल्प लेना होगा कि हम मिलकर काम करेंगे एक दूसरे का सहयोग करेंगे साथ देंगे हमें ग्लोबल कार्बन बजट में सभी विकासशील देशों को उचित शेयर देना होगा वी हैव टू बी मोर बैलेंस हमें यह संकल्प लेना होगा कि एडोप्शन मिटिगेशन क्लाइमेट फाइनेंस टेक्नोलॉजी लॉस एंड डैमेज इन सब पर संतुलन बनाते हुए आगे बढ़े वी हैव टू बी एम्बिशियस हमें संकल्प लेना होगा कि एनर्जी ट्रांजिशन जस्ट हो इंक्लूसिव हो इक्विटेबल हो वी हैव टू बी इनोवेटिव हमें यह संकल्प लेना होगा कि इनोवेटिव टेक्नोलॉजी का लगातार विकास करें अपने स्वार्थ से ऊपर उठकर दूसरे देशों को टेक्नोलॉजी ट्रांसफर करें क्लीन एनर्जी सप्लाई चेन को सशक्त करें फ्रेंड भारत यूएन फ्रेमवर्क फॉर क्लाइमेट चेंज प्रोसेस के प्रति प्रतिबद्ध है इसलिए आज मैं इस मंच से 2028 में कोप 
2023-2028 में कॉप 33 समिट को भारत में होस्ट करने का प्रस्ताव भी रखता हूं मुझे आशा है कि आने वाले 12 दिनों में ग्लोबल स्टॉक टेक की समीक्षा से हमें सुरक्षित और उज्जवल भविष्य का रास्ता मिलेगा कल लॉस एंड डैमेज फंड को ऑपरेशनलाइज करने का जो निर्णय लिया गया है उससे हम सभी की उम्मीद और बड़ी है मुझे विश्वास है यूएई की मेजबानी में ये कॉप ट्वेंटी एट समिट सफलता की नई ऊंचाई पर पहुंचेगी मैं मेरे ब्रदर हिजाइने से मोहम्मद बिन जायद और संयुक्त राष्ट्र संघ के सेक्रेटरी जनरल इलेक्शन एक्सी गुटेज को मुझे ये विशेष सम्मान देने के लिए विशेष रूप से आभार व्यक्त करता हूं आप सभी का बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद थैंक यू थैंक यू योर एक्सलेंसी It is now my distinct pleasure to invite His Excellency Mr. Denis Francis. Thank you, Your Excellency. It is now my pleasure to welcome His Excellency Mr. Charles Michel, President of the European Council, and Her Excellency Ms. Ursula von der Leyen, President of the European Commission. Your Excellencies, you have the floor. Monsieur le Président de la COP28. Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, chacun en veut dire des qualités. Des inondations qui ravagent, des feux qui détruisent, des populations déracinées et déplacées, plus aucun continent n'échappe à la tragédie du changement climatique. Et pourtant, la science, la connaissance, la raison nous amènent à connaître le diagnostic pas seulement le diagnostic, nous connaissons aussi les solutions. Nous devons maintenir l'objectif de 1,5 degré et nous devons nous débarrasser le plus rapidement possible de nos dépendances aux énergies fossiles qui mettent notre avenir commun en danger. Mesdames et Messieurs, ce sommet n'est pas une simple conférence. Ce sommet est en réalité un examen et même un examen de conscience faire le bilan mondial depuis les accords de Paris et surtout agir plus et agir plus rapidement. Nous saluons le leadership d'Antonio Guterres, nous saluons aussi la manière dont les Émirats arabes sont engagés pour faire de cette COP28 un succès. Pour sa part, l'Union européenne est totalement mobilisée et engagée. Nous souhaitons continuer à jouer un rôle moteur. La transition climat est notre programme de développement, le Green Deal, Fit for 55, nous mettons en œuvre des paquets de mesures pour transformer radicalement notre paradigme de développement économique. On a ainsi progressé en baissant de 30% nos émissions depuis 1990. Nous croyons dans la mécanique du prix du carbone pour continuer à avancer sur le bon chemin et encourageons d'autres à nous soutenir. Nous avons la détermination de tripler le renouvelable, de doubler l'efficacité énergétique et puis nous sommes aux côtés des pays en développement. Nous savons notre solidarité, nous savons notre responsabilité, c'est une question de confiance, c'est ainsi que nous honorons nos engagements relatifs aux 100 milliards. 23 milliards d'euros sont mobilisés cette année par l'Union européenne. Nous soutenons nos engagements en termes de partenariat pour des transitions énergétiques justes et puis nous sommes mobilisés pour soutenir le Fonds pour les pertes et dommages. 220 millions ont été annoncés hier par l'Union européenne en format équipe Union européenne. Nous soutenons aussi la réforme des institutions de Bretton Woods. Nous devons amener plus de justice, plus de confiance, plus d'inclusivité. La Banque mondiale, dont elle a été créée, était sept fois plus capitalisée qu'elle ne l'est aujourd'hui. L'Union européenne est un partenaire loyal et engagé parce que, en effet, la terre ne nous appartient pas. La terre appartient à nos enfants. Ce n'est pas un slogan publicitaire. C'est une réalité existentielle. La décennie qui s'ouvre est cruciale et nous sommes tout à fait mobilisés 
à travailler avec chacun d'entre vous pour protéger l'humanité. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Your Excellency. It is my pleasure to welcome Her Excellency, Mr. Ursula von der Leyen, President of the European Commission. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. President, fellow leaders. Last September, at the Climate Action Summit in New York, we called for concrete action. Now, in Dubai, we have to deliver. At this COP, we will set a decisive step forward to protect the most vulnerable citizens worldwide. They undergo runaway climate change. They suffer loss and damage, and we will stand by their side. This COP is about ambition, it is about targets, and it is about finance. Let me start with ambition. Global emissions must peak by 2025. We must phase out fossil fuels, and we must reduce methane emissions. But what we are calling for globally, we also have to deliver domestically. So let me report on what we do in the European Union. The European Union has peaked already. We have reduced emissions, and we are on track to overshoot our target for 2030. And we just adopted a law to drastically reduce methane emissions. Second, on targets. This COP can make history. Last spring, the European Union launched a call to triple renewables and to double energy efficiency by 2030. We were joined by some early champions like the COP presidency, President Ruto, Prime Minister Motley, and many thanks to the International Energy Agency and IRENA for your strong support. By now, our call has grown into a powerful movement. More than 110 countries have already joined. That's fantastic. So I call now on all of us to include these targets in the final COP decision, because this sends a strong message to investors and consumers alike, there is no doubt the future of energy will be clean, it will be affordable, and it will be homegrown. And finally, on finance, we must meet the 100 billion target this year. Europe consistently delivered. Last year, the European Union contributed close to $30 billion in public climate finance. And of course, the European Union will contribute to the new loss and damage fund. As of today, Team Europe is contributing more than $270 million so far. We must get the fund up and running, and we must to do it fast. But we all know more is needed. We need to reform the international financial system. We need a strong green bond market and we need more carbon pricing. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow leaders, dear friends, I wish for a successful COP28. Many thanks. Thank you, Your Excellency. May I remind the speaker to maintain three minutes speaking time limit. Thank you. It is my pleasure to welcome Her Excellency, Mr. Samia Hululu Hassan, President of the United Republic of Tanzania. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Your Excellency, President of COP28, your Highnesses and Majesties, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. In Copenhagen, we committed 100 billion annually for climate action. Though far less than required, it is still not forthcoming. In Paris, we resolved to keep warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. However, 
the current rate of warming is alarming. It must be said, unfulfilled commitment erode solidarity and trust and have detrimental and costly consequences for developing countries. My own country is losing two to 3% of its GDP due to climate change. Excellencies, the clock is ticking. This year's IPCC report cautioned that adaptation options that are visible and effective today will become constrained and less effective with increasing global warming. Putting in place the global goal on adaptation framework is a matter of urgency and not a choice. We must match our intent with our actions and we must act now. The decision is therefore ours, adhere to science or face con the consequences. On our part, the United Republic of Tanzania, despite of our minimum emission contribution, we are doing our part. At this COP28, we seek to mobilize support for increased use of clean and affordable co cooking fuels and technologies across Africa, especially for women. Our call is for all of us to play our part. Excellencies, Honoring our commitments and advancing the pace of climate action is a solution to this scourge. As we seek to unite, act, and deliver here in Dubai, we must deliver on climate finance. Thanks for affecting, affecting the loss and damage fund. So let us now um, make the fund be accessible for developing countries, predictable, and of course, transparency should be the way of operation. I thank you very much for your. Thank you, Your Excellency. It is my pleasure to welcome His Excellency, Mr. Gitana Nauseda, President of Lithuania. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, every year we come together to talk about the need for a change, to get the change we so desperately need. We must become the change. For many years now, Lithuania, together with the whole European Union, has been undergoing, thank you, an ambitious transformation and working on the global climate action. At first, Lithuania made a strategic decision to seek energy independence. We have built our own LNG terminal, which decreased prices and turned Lithuania into a regional gas hub. Now we are proudly sharing our expertise worldwide. Today, we see renewable energy as and the ultimate means of securing full energy independence and resilience while also helping the planet Earth. By 2030, Lithuania is going to shift from the net importer of electricity to a self-sufficient green energy producer. We plan for renewable electricity generation to grow almost sevenfold. Last year, Lithuania was the second country globally in the solar energy generation increase. My country intends to use excess renewable electricity capacities to produce green hydrogen and to address energy efficiency. The second pillar of the green transformation through new ambitious plans. Our general aim is to achieve a 70% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 compared to 1990 levels and to become climate neutral by 2050. The global response to can only be strengthened by methodical adaptation to climate change. 
We must all seek to be more resilient, to change our habits, and to reduce existing vulnerabilities. We also have to address the worst cases of ecocide, such as the one committed by Russia in its war of aggression against Ukraine. These actions are incompatible with international law and go against our joint efforts to stop climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, today Lithuania strongly commends the presidency for a strong global response to the first global stock take of the Paris Agreement. We call on all leaders to approve global 2030 renewables and energy efficiency targets. Let us work together as one team. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. It is my pleasure to welcome His Excellency, Mr. Emerson Dambukso Nagawa, President of Zimbabwe. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Your Excellencies, Heads of State and Government, allow me to express my sincere gratitude to the government people of the United Arab Emirates for successfully hosting this COP28 and for the hospitality extended to me and my delegation since our arrival here. Zimbabwe, like many other nations, continues to suffer from the negative social economic impacts of increased frequency of droughts, heightened intensity of tropical cyclones and other severe weather events. No country can adapt to or mitigate these impacts alone. The ambitious emissions reductions expected from developed countries are urgent and critical to prevent a climate catastrophe. This is critical to ensure that vulnerable communities and workers in traditional industries are not left behind and that the transition benefits all while also creating decent green jobs and promoting social and economic stability. The global economic system the ways we produce and consume, and the resource we use to support economic growth must all undergo drastic changes in order to meaningfully implement the goals of the Paris Agreement. Zimbabwe is walking the talk on its revised nationally determined contributions. We are offering diverse opportunities for carbon trading in the energy sector through investments in solar, wind, mineral hydro, and geothermal power generation. However, the illegal economic sanctions imposed on our country are inadvertently hindering climate action by impending progress in our quest to address environmental challenges. We reiterate our calls for the immediate and unconditional lifting of these heinous sanctions. Aspects related to sustainable methods for increased agriculture production and productivity remain essential to our ability to feed ourselves. We welcome the first global stock tech at this COP28, which should help us to continuously review, improve, and transparently disclose our climate plans. This COP28 is called upon to persist in the mobilization of resources and adopting clear strategies for achieving the promised 100 billion climate finance. Let us all fulfill our responsibilities and use this gathering as another opportunity to carve out a sustainable future.
for the generations to come. May history remember us as those who took bold and resolute action to preserve our planet. I thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. It is my pleasure to welcome His Excellency, Mr. Umaro Sisoko Mbalo, President of Guinea Gisao. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Señor Dr. Sultan Al Jaber, President of the COP28, Como muitos países da África Ocidental, a Guiné-Bissau é particularmente vulnerável às alterações climáticas. As nossas comunidades costeiras estão sujeitas à elevação do nível do mar. As nossas safras agrícolas enfrentam condições climáticas cada vez mais imprevisíveis e a nossa biodiversidade está sob constante ameaça E, no entanto, embora vítimas das alterações climáticas, somos também autores ativos na busca de solução. Temos empreendido ações significativas para a implementação da estratégia de gestão sustentável dos nossos recursos naturais, a promoção de energias limpas e renováveis e a adaptação de infraestruturas críticas para resistir aos impactos climáticos. A conservação da biodiversidade é uma prioridade máxima para nós. O nosso país é abençoada com uma rica diversidade de espécies e ecossistemas únicos e estamos empenhados em protegê-los. Para as gerações futuras, acreditamos que a biodiversidade é intrinsecamente ligada à nossa própria resiliência como nação. Esse desiderado, consubstanciada, se decreta mais de 26% do nosso território como áreas protegidas, ultrapassando a meta de 11 da XI da Convenção das Nações Unidas sobre a Diversidade Biológica. Minhas senhoras e meus senhores, todas essas problemáticas sustentam de que a crise climática é uma ameaça global que requer uma resposta global. Nenhum país deve ser deixado para trás e é fundamental que as nações desenvolvidas cumpram com as suas obrigações financeiras e da assistência técnica para ajudar os países em desenvolvimento a enfrentar os desafios das alterações climáticas. Falando em recursos financeiros, retiramos a necessidade de fundos novos e adicionais para apoiar a adaptação e a mitigação das alterações climáticas. Nos países em desenvolvimento, esses recursos são cruciais para garantir que possamos implementar as medidas necessárias para enfrentar essa crise. Quanto à questão das perdas e danos climáticos, pedimos uma boa abordagem mais robusta e equitativa. As comunidades mais vulneráveis não podem ser abandonadas a enfrentar sozinhas as consequências devastadoras dos eventos climáticos extremos e catastróficos naturais. Reforçamos o nosso compromisso com o Acordo de Paris, e com a construção de um novo regime climático baseado na justiça e na equidade. No entanto, é importante que façamos um balanço global consequente no nosso progresso até agora. O tempo está se esgotando e a ação decisiva é necessária para evitar as piores consequências das alterações climáticas. É nesse espírito que a Guiné-Bissau está empenhado em trabalhar em cooperação com todos os países presentes nessa conferência. Junto podemos traçar um caminho e adotar medidas adequadas para um fim futuro 
mais sustentável, resiliente e justo para todas as nações e para as gerações futuras com o fito de proteger o nosso planeta. Muito obrigado. Thank you, Your Excellency. It is my pleasure to welcome His Excellency Mr. Denis Sassou Negeso, President of Congo. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Mesdames et Messieurs, le Chef d'État et de Gouvernement, Monsieur le Secrétaire Général des Nations Unies, Monsieur le Président de la COP28, euh, Mesdames et Messieurs, je voudrais adresser mes sincères remerciements à Son Altesse Mohamed Ben Zayed Al Nayan, Président des Émirats Arabes Unis, pour l'accueil chaleureux et l'hospitalité réservé à ma délégation et à moi-même. Je saisis cette opportunité pour réaffirmer le ferme engagement et la détermination de mon pays, la République du Congo, à participer activement à l'effort mondial de lutte contre les changements climatiques. Vous me permettrez, avant de poursuivre, de rappeler ce qu'à notre niveau et en tant que président de la Commission climat du bassin du Congo, nous avons parcouru comme chemin depuis plus d'une décennie. Après l'accord de Paris, le rôle essentiel de nos forêts tropicales du bassin du Congo dans la régulation du climat a été enfin reconnu comme l'un des derniers poumons verts de la planète. Et les enjeux sont connus et les solutions ont été identifiées. Préoccupé par la recherche de ressources durables pour financer la gestion des écosystèmes forestiers et la préservation de sa biodiversité, nous avons initié l'idée de la création du Fonds bleu pour le bassin du Congo dans le but de concilier la lutte contre les changements climatiques et le développement économique. Persuadé de l'importance des solutions basées sur la nature pour atteindre les objectifs de développement durable, ainsi que ceux de la décennie des Nations Unies pour la restauration des écosystèmes, j'ai lancé lors de la COP27 à Chamechèque l'appel solennel à l'instauration d'une décennie mondiale de la forestation afin d'inverser le coût actuel de la destruction de nos forêts. C'est dans ce contexte que, douze ans après sa première édition, mon pays a abrité en octobre dernier à Brazzaville le deuxième sommet des trois bassins forestiers tropicaux et de biodiversité, à savoir l'Amazonie, le Bornéo-Mekong, Asie du Sud-Est et le Congo. Mesdames et Messieurs, les défis qui nous attendent sont considérables et ne cessent de croître d'année en année. Certains relèvent de notre propre responsabilité. Il nous revient de redoubler d'ardeur pour préserver ces derniers poumons de la planète et ces trésors de biodiversité que sont nos forêts tropicales. Ainsi, le devoir de solidarité 
à travers les demandes de compensation financière suite au renoncement volontaire de certains pays à des projets de développement non durable appelle et mérite toute l'attention de la communauté internationale. C'est le juste effort de solidarité et d'équité qui incombe à tous les pays appelés à œuvrer ensemble pour une planète Terre plus sûre, à l'abri des menaces et autres effets néfastes des changements climatiques. Mesdames et Messieurs, il n'est pas trop tard, il n'est jamais trop tard pour mieux faire. Et je sais, Monsieur le Président de la COP28, que telle est votre ambition. Aussi, tous mes voeux et ceux du peuple congolais vous accompagnent pour que ce rendez-vous planétaire de Dubaï soit celui de la solidarité internationale. Ce combat, nous ne pouvons pas le perdre. N'oublions pas que l'histoire nous jugera sur la façon dont nous l'aurons menée. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Your Excellency. This is my pleasure to welcome His Excellency Mr. Mohamed Sheikh El Ghazazwani, President of Mauritania. Your Excellency, you have the floor. أصحاب الجلالة والفخامة والسمو أصحاب المعالي السادة والسيدات أيها الحضور الكريم أود ابتداء أن أتقدم بجزيل الشكر لأخي صاحب السمو والشيخ محمد بن زايد آل نهيان رئيس دولة الإمارات العربية المتحدة الشقيقة على حفاوة الاستقبال وكرم الضيافة الأصيل مهنئا إياه والشعب الإماراتي عموما على الاحتفاء بعيد الاتحاد وعلى استضافة هذه الدورة 28 في قمة دول الاتفاقية في قمة دول الاتفاقية الأمم المتحدة الإطارية حول التغير المناخي فلطالما تبوأت دولة الإمارات العربية المتحدة بفضل الرؤى الاستشرافية لقيادتها الحكيمة مواقع الريادة في مجال تعزيز الاستدامة عموما وجهة التحديات البيئية خصوصا وأهنئ كذلك صاحب المعالي سلطان الجابر رئيس قمة كوب 28 على التنظيم المحكم لهذه الدورة كما أتقدم بالشكر الجزيل إلى صاحب المعالي السيد أنطونيو غوتيريس الأمين العام لمنظمة الأمم المتحدة على جهوده الكبيرة في مجال التغيرات المناخية أيها السادة والسيدات لا تبرز وحدة المصير الإنساني في أي مستوى من مستويات الحياة بأقوى وأوضح مما تتجلى عليه في التحديات البيئية فمواجهة التغيرات المناخية إذا معركتنا جميعا نربحها معا أو نخسرها معا وكلنا ندرك أن لا سبيل لكسبها إلا بتضافر الجهود والتعاضد والتضامن وهي تخاض أساسا على مسارين مسار تعزيز القدرة على التكيف والصمود في وجه الانعكاسات السلبية للتغيرات المناخية على الأنسجة الاقتصادية والاجتماعية خاصة في الدول الأقل نموة ومسار الحد تدريجي من الانبعاثات الغازية ببناء مسارات تنموية ضئيلة الاعتماد على الكربون 
والتوسع في استخدام الطاقات المتجددة الناضجة ولن تكون النتائج على أي من المسارين إلا بقدر التعاون والتضامن الدوليين وباد للعيام أن هذا التضامن لا يزال من حيث الحجم والفاعلية دون المستوى المطلوب فمن الملح والضروري إذا زيادة التمويلات الموجهة للتكيف والتحول البيئي بشكل كبير ودفعها على نحو لا يفاقم مديونية الدول النامية أيها السادة والسيدات إننا في الجمهورية الإسلامية الموريتانية من أكثر الدول تأثراً بالتغيرات المناخية وما ينشأ عنها من تصحر وجفاف واضطراب في التساقطات المطرية من حيث الندرة والغزارة فقد أصبح التصحر يغطي ما يربو على 80% من مساحتنا الترابية وتسببت موجات الجفاف المتتالية في تمزيق أنسجتنا الاجتماعية والاقتصادية الريفية على قطاعات حيوية مثل الموارد المائية والإنتاج الزراعي والتنمية الحيوانية والثروة البحرية والمنظومات البيئية الطبيعية ولذلك فنحن مدركون جيدا أن مواجهة التغيرات المناخية ضرورة اجتماعية واقتصادية وبيئية بل وأمنية وانطلاقا من ذلك بذلنا جهودا كبيرة في مكافحة التصحر من خلال مبادرة السور الأخضر الكبير والمساهمة النشطة في لجنة المناخ لمنطقة الساحل واللجنة المشتركة لمكافحة آثار الجفاف الساحل وباعتماد ميثاق مبادرة الشرق الأوسط الأخضر التي أطلقتها المملكة العربية السعودية الشقيقة كما استثمرنا في التسيير المستدام للمناطق البحرية والساحلية ذات النفع البيئي العالمي وعلاوة على ذلك <تصفيق> عفوا وعلاوة على ذلك سعينا بكل الجهود إلى تعزيز قدرة مواطنينا على الصمود والتكيف مع تداعيات التغير المناخي على على المنظومات الاجتماعية والاقتصادية. هذا على مستوى دعم التكيف والصمود، لكننا لم نغفل مسار بناء تنمية أقل اعتمادا على الكربون بالاستثمار الكبير في الطاقات المتجددة. فعلى الرغم من ضآلة إسهامنا في انبعاثات غازات الاحتباس الحراري فقد استطعنا زيادة حصة الطاقات المتجددة من مجمل استهلاكنا الطاقوي على نحو معتبر حيث وصلت إلى 34% سنة 2020 مع التخطيط للوصول إلى نسبة 50% سنة 2030 وبفضل برنامجنا الواسع لتطوير الهيدروجين الأخضر الذي هو الآن قيد الإطلاق فإننا واثقون من تحقيق الهدف الذي رسمناه في مساهمتنا المناخية الوطنية المراجعة والمتمثل في خفض الانبعاثات الكربونية بنسبة 11% غير أننا في كل هذه الجهود لا نزال نحتاج شأننا في ذلك شأن معظم الدول النامية إلى زيادة الدعم الدولي لتعزيز القدرة على الصمود والتكيف ولتأمين انتقال طاقوي منصف وفعال وإنني أجدد الدعوة لرفع مستوى الدعم للدول النامية في مواجهتها للتحديات البيئية لا أرجو لأعمال قمتنا هذه كل التوفيق والنجاح والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله Thank you, Your Excellency It is my pleasure to welcome His Excellency Mr. Kassim Jomar Tokajev President of Kazakhstan Your Excellency, you have the floor. Kazakhstan fully supports the United Nations' urgent call for tangible actions to safeguard our environment for future generations. We were the first country in the region to have ratified the Paris Agreement and adopted a carbon neutrality strategy for 2060. The resulting new environmental code for, of Kazakhstan will drive comprehensive adaptation of green technology in practically every sector of our national economy. This is extraordinary potential 
there is an extraordinary potential for wind and solar power in my country, as well as for green hydrogen. We will continue to work closely with our partners to unlock it. As the world's leading exporter of uranium, providing 43% of global supply, Kazakhstan plays a crucial role in carbon-free electricity generation on a global scale. Indeed, as the world decarbonizes in the coming decades, critical minerals, including rare earth metals, will become indispensable. Kazakhstan is poised to become a major supplier of these transition minerals. We are also actively supporting private green initiatives. For example, Kazakhstan-based the Plastic Association works on plastic waste free projects contributing to eco-friendly solutions. Cutting methane emissions is the fastest opportunity we have to immediately slow the rate of global warming. That's why I am pleased to announce today that Kazakhstan has decided to join the Global Methane Pledge. At the same time, we are eager to tackle the enormous challenge of coal in our region by implementing our region's first ever Just Energy Transition Partnership in Kazakhstan. For both of these to succeed, we look to our friends and partners for their concrete support. More widely, we look to the international community to scale up its commitments to greater meaningful climate finance. But finance is just the first hurdle. Even if we successfully limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees by 2050, Central Asian countries will still experience up to 2.5 degrees of temperature rise. So adaptation is both inevitable and imperative. Therefore, we urge that more resources be allocated to support the International Fund for Saving the RLC. Moreover, we are pleased together with France to co-chair the first One Water Summit on the margins of the next United Nations General Assembly. To build a, mom a momentum on climate action in Central Asia, we decided to convene a regional climate summit in Kazakhstan in 2026 under the United Nations auspices. The climate emergency is a global crisis that requires a global response. Kazakhstan firmly believes that only through collective action and cooperation, we can resolve the climate crisis. And finally, I extend my warmest congratulations to His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahayan for successful COP28 presidency. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. It is my pleasure to welcome His Excellency Mr. Santiago Peña Palacios, President of Paraguay. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Excelencias, me siento honrado de participar de la COP28. Nos reunimos aquí diferentes culturas y tradiciones para definir en conjunto cómo abordar un desafío común, los efectos negativos del cambio climático. Esto demuestra que no es cierto que no pueda existir un diálogo entre tradiciones distintas. Espero sinceramente que aquí en Dubái marquemos un antes y un después en las medidas para reparar el daño aparecido en la tierra y el mar por manos humanas. Dichas medidas de protección al ambiente, empero, deben ser rigurosas y justas. Sobre todo, deben respetar los principios rectores del Acuerdo de París, como el de responsabilidades compartidas, pero diferenciadas, teniendo en cuenta las capacidades y condiciones particulares de los Estados, especialmente en aquellos que necesitamos afianzar nuestro desarrollo. En mi país, Paraguay, 100% de la energía es limpia y es renovable. Sí, escucharon bien. 100% de la energía es limpia y es renovable. Albergamos una riqueza biológica única y un sólido potencial como sumidero de carbono. 
El 44% del territorio nacional cuenta con cobertura forestal y el 15% se encuentra bajo el régimen de áreas silvestres protegidas. El 94% de la superficie sembrada de soja en la región oriental de mi país, de la que somos el sexto Credit Initiative. Y el Carbon Credit que comercial mantenta se aage bardkar, jan bhagidari se carbon sink banane ka abhiyan hai. Main umid karta hu ki aap sab isse jarur judenge. Saathiyo, pichli shatabdi ki galtiyon ko sudharne ke liye hamare paas बहुत ज्यादा समय नहीं है मानव जाति के एक छोटे हिस्से ने प्रकृति का अंधा धुंध दोहन किया लेकिन इसकी कीमत पूरी मानवता को चुकानी पड़ रही है विशेषकर ग्लोबल साउथ के निवासियों को सिर्फ मेरा भला हो ये सोच दुनिया को एक अंधेरे की तरफ ले जाएगी इस हॉल में बैठा प्रत्येक व्यक्ति प्रत्येक राष्ट्राध्यक्ष बहुत बड़ी जिम्मेदारी के साथ यहां आया है हम में से सभी को अपने दायित्व निभाने ही होंगे पूरी दुनिया आज हमें देख रही है इस धरती का भविष्य हमें देख रहा है हमें सफल होना ही होगा वी हैव टू डू टू बी डिसीजिव हमें संकल्प लेना होगा कि हर देश अपने लिए जो क्लाइमेट टारगेट तय कर रहा है जो कमिटमेंट कर रहा है वो पूरा कर कर ही दिखाएगा वी हैव टू वर्क इन यूनिटी हमें संकल्प लेना होगा कि हम मिलकर काम करेंगे एक दूसरे का सहयोग करेंगे साथ देंगे हमें ग्लोबल कार्बन बजट में सभी विकासशील देशों को उचित शेयर देना होगा वी हैव टू बी मोर बैलेंस हमें यह संकल्प लेना होगा कि एडोप्शन मिटिगेशन क्लाइमेट फाइनेंस टेक्नोलॉजी लॉस एंड डैमेज इन सब पर संतुलन बनाते हुए आगे बढ़े वी हैव टू बी एम्बिशियस हमें संकल्प लेना होगा कि एनर्जी ट्रांजिशन जस्ट हो इंक्लूसिव हो इक्विटेबल हो वी हैव टू बी इनोवेटिव हमें यह संकल्प लेना होगा कि इनोवेटिव टेक्नोलॉजी का लगातार विकास करें अपने स्वार्थ से ऊपर उठकर दूसरे देशों को टेक्नोलॉजी ट्रांसफर करें क्लीन एनर्जी सप्लाई चेन को सशक्त करें फ्रेंड भारत यूएन फ्रेमवर्क फॉर क्लाइमेट चेंज प्रोसेस के प्रति प्रतिबद्ध है इसलिए आज मैं इस मंच से 2028 में को 33, 2028 में कॉप 33 समिट को भारत में होस्ट करने का प्रस्ताव भी रखता हूं मुझे आशा है कि आने वाले 12 दिनों में ग्लोबल स्टॉक टेक की समीक्षा से हमें सुरक्षित और उज्जवल भविष्य का रास्ता मिलेगा कल लॉस एंड डैमेज फंड को ऑपरेशनलाइज करने का जो निर्णय लिया गया है उससे हम सभी की उम्मीद और बड़ी है मुझे विश्वास है यूएई की मेजबानी में ये कॉप ट्वेंटी एट समिट सफलता की नई ऊंचाई पर पहुंचेगी मैं मेरे ब्रदर हिजाइने से मोहम्मद बिन जायद और संयुक्त राष्ट्र संघ के सेक्रेटरी जनरल इलेक्शन श्री गुटेज को मुझे ये विशेष सम्मान देने के लिए विशेष रूप से आभार व्यक्त करता हूं आप सभी का बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद थैंक यू
Thank you, Your Excellency. It is now my distinct pleasure to invite His Excellency. إلى زيادة الفقر، فقر وزيادة معدل النزوح الداخلي والهجرة الخارجية. إن الصراع فيما يخص المياه ليس جديدا وضع العراق. كدولة مصب ليس نادرا ولضمان التوزيع العادل للمياه نرجو أن يشمل نقاشكم فيما يخص الخسائر والأضرار والحقوق العادلة للدول المصب لضمان أمنها المائي فلا أمن غذائي من دون ماء وهنا نشير إلى ما قام به أسلافنا في بلاد الرافدين حيث أوجدوا حلولا لهذه الإشكالية قبل 4500 سنة وذلك بعقد أول اتفاقية لتقاسم الموارد المائية عن طريق التفاوض وها نحن اليوم نسعى لذلك على مستوى عالمي من خلال مجموعة من الاتفاقيات آخرها اتفاقية الحماية والاستخدام المستدام للمياه العادلة والتي نعمل اعتمادها وتفعيلها بالسرعة الممكنة يأتيكم العراق متأخراً إذا لم ينتمي لاتفاقية المناخ إلا سنة 2009 وذلك بسبب إهمال النظام السابق للبيئة إلى أننا مصممون على مضى قدما وبخطوات متسارعة لكي نقوم بما يجب علينا فقد قدم العراق وثيقة مساهمته المحدودة وطنيا NDC لتكون السياسة العليا الطموحة لزيادة المرونة تجاه تغيير المناخ والتي ترسم خططنا المستقبلية لتخفيف وتكييف وإنجاز أهداف التنمية المستدامة بسنة 2030 لذا يتم إعداد تقرير البلاغ الوطني الثاني للتغييرات المناخية والتقرير المحدد لكل سنتين والخاص بجد الانبعاثات في العراق وهو ما يعكس التزام العراق بمشاركة العالم بالتزامات المناخية وبناء على ذلك اتخذت الحكومة العراقية إجراءات سريعة لتنفيذ مشاريع الطاقة النظيفة والمتجددة وللتقرير الانبعاثات الغاز المصاحب في إنتاج النفط وإيقاف حرقه والاستفادة منه وصولا إلى تصوير انبعاثات الغاز المصاحب في 2030 وتخفيض انبعاثات الغازية الدفيئة من منظومة الكهربائية من خلال تعزيز كفاءتها نحن على ثقة بأن مخرجات مؤتمر دبي للمناخ ستكون شاملة ومتوازنة ومنصفة فيما يخص التقييم العالمي والانتخال العادل والصنوق الخسائر والأضرار والهدف العالمي لتكييف مستندة إلى مبدأ المسؤولية المشتركة لكل ما في المياه وحسب القدرات والظروف الوطنية لكل دولة وبما يحقق الانتقال العادل والمنصف نحو الطاقة النظيفة المتجددة والمستدامة وزيادة مرونة التكييف مع التغيير المناخي مع مراعاة حاجة البلدان النامية في الحصول على تمويل المناخي لبناء القدرات ونقل التكنولوجيا. وفيما يخص منطقتنا فإن العراق والدول المجاورة في الخليج على خطوط أمامية لمجابهة آثار التغييرات المناخية وحتى إن استطاع العالم أن ينجز أهداف اتفاق باريس ويحدد من زيادة معدل الحرارة إلى ما دون درجتين. إلى أن ارتفاع الحرارة خاصة على شواطئ الخليج سيتجاوز هذا الحد لعدة درجات ونحن منذ الآن نعاني من ارتفاع درجات الحرارة ومن العواصف الترابية ومن شحة المياه وكذلك هذه التغييرات لا تعترف بحدود الدول كما أن دولنا تعتمد في اقتصادنا على الوقود الأحفوري وهي فئة تأخذ اتفاقية المناخ ظروفها الخاصة بنظر الاعتبار وكل إجراء يقوم به أي منا سواء في مجال التخفيف أو مجال أو في مجال التكييف سيكون له أثر إيجابي يمتد إلى دول الأخرى فلا خيار لدينا إلا أن نتظافر بجهودنا كي نواجه سوية وبكل إمكانياتنا أخطار تغيير المناخ المناخي لذا ومن هذه المنصة ندعو دول الجوار في الخليج إلى بذل مزيد من الجهود للسعي معا كمجموعة تفاوضية واحدة وموقف موحد يبين صعوبة مستقبلنا المناخي للعالم ويسعى لضمان حقوق شعبنا 
وإقامة تجمع إقليمي يضم الدول المتشعرة في الثمان على الخليج وهي التي ستتعرض أكثر من غيرها لآثار تغييرات المناخ الخطيرة وفي الختام لا يفوتنا إلا وإن ندين العدوان المستمر على غزة ونطالب المجتمع الدولي بالوقوف أمام هذا العدوان ونكرر موقفنا في العراق في القضية الفلسطينية حقه في القضية الفلسطينية حقه في تقرير المصير وأشكركم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Thank you, Your Excellency. It is my pleasure to welcome His Excellency, Mr. Alexander Busik, President of Serbia. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, First and foremost, allow me to extend a heartfelt congratulations to the United Arab Emirates government for bringing the world together at a critical moment for global transformative climate action, despite the challenges we all face today worldwide. As we once again gather to face the greatest challenge of our time, we are at a critical time in the fight against climate change. Catastrophic global warming and ongoing extreme weather events are casting a dangerous shadow over our collective future. Today I stand before you not only as the representative of the Republic of Serbia, but also as a global citizen advocating for global well-being. Across the border of the Republic of Serbia, the echoes of climate change resonate disturbingly loudly. Our country is at the forefront, struggling with alarmingly high average temperatures above the global average, since average temperature in Serbia already increased by 1.8 degrees Celsius and in summer it is as high as 2.6 degrees Celsius. At the same time, climate projections indicate that if we continue business as usual, by the end of the century, we can expect an increase in the average temperature up to 5.8 degrees Celsius, a cataclysm of a kind that threatens our economic and social fabric. This year will most certainly take the infamous title of the warmest ever recorded, not just globally, but in our country as well. Aside from warmest months ever recording being July, August, September, and October, we witnessed for the first time two tropical nights with temperatures over 20 degrees Celsius during the month of October, which is unheard of in Serbia. In addition, we are still calculating the damage drought made to our economy last year, while on the other hand, severe storms devastated our cities, causing a vast damage as well. We must stand united against climate change, and we must act now. We will continue to contribute the global fight against climate change by improving our national system for mitigation and adaptation in line with our national circumstances and with the support of our development partners. In steadfast response, steadfast response to this existential threat, I'm honored to announce the government of the Republic of Serbia's unwavering commitment. In June of this year, we charted a transformative course with the adoption of our low carbon development strategy which served as the basis for revised national determined contribution that raised the ambition of our initial NDC by more than three times. Long-term requirements of the Paris Agreement as well as the EU accession process are the basis for long-term vision of the strategy that by 2050 Serbia will be a low-carbon society with a competitive and resource-efficient economy which provides to citizens new green jobs and quality life in a climate-resilient society. With this in mind and guided by science, we also developed our climate change adaption program, which is to be adopted in the forthcoming period. Adaption program will provide climate risk and vulnerability assessment and propose medium and long-term adap adaptation policies and measures in the most vulnerable sectors, such as agriculture, infrastructure, forestry, and human health. Recognizing that the fight against climate change transcends borders, we issue a solemn call to action for all. While our national progress is unstoppable, it is part of a larger puzzle. The Republic of Serbia is ready to play its role in the global orchestra against climate change. We call upon the international community, especially our developed counterparts, to honor their commitments to financial and technical assistance. Let this be a call for armed cooperation and shared responsibility, a call for the clarity of saying one against the pessimistic scenarios. Although I have to add something, which is my personal opinion, 
And once again, many thanks to Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, the President of the United Arab Emirates, for his great hospitality. Just would like to say that we all gathered here because of a terribly difficult problem that we are facing with, which is climate change. But how are we going to resolve this issue if we are not able to resolve all the geopolitical problems we are facing with today? There are many wars throughout the world that we haven't been able to stop in the recent period. And uh, moreover, I'm afraid that we won't be able to do so. If we were not capable of delivering results in this, how we can be so sure, how we can be so certain that we'll deliver the very best results, the very proper results on climate change issues as well. And just to add to that, I believe that bringing us all back to the real principles of the organization of the United Nations that we established after the Second World War, because we have to act in accordance and adherence with rules, regulations that were accepted by most of the members of the international community, by most or, or by all the states of international community. It has to happen, otherwise we'll always face arbitration, different approaches, and we'll never deliver better results even on this. You cannot have different approaches towards territorial integrities of some countries, and we as Serbia know this better than anyone else dare to say. And on the other hand, I heard today a phrase, as we come together, as we come together, as we come together, let us find a common denominator which will mean, which will find a way, find a path to resolve firstly the biggest geopolitical issues and then to tackle in a very proper way an issue of climate changes which is becoming one of the most important. Thank you once again. Thank you, Your Excellency. It is my pleasure to welcome His Excellency Mr. Wawel John Charles Rankalawan, President of Seychelles. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Your Highness uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nayan, President of COP28, Dr. Sultan Al Jaber, Heads of State and Government, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen. I would like to express my gratitude to His Highness uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nayan and to the people of the United Arab Emirates for the warm welcome and hospitality extended to my delegation and myself. I take this opportunity to congratulate you on the organization of COP28 and wish you prosperity as you celebrate your 52nd National Day. The collective efforts to foster cooperation in response to the most pressing issue of our time are indeed commendable. I am honored, therefore, to address this esteemed assembly on behalf of the people of Seychelles. In our shared pursuit of a sustainable future, the urgency of our deliberations here in Dubai cannot be overstated. As parties to the convention, we committed to deliver on commitments such as the USD 100 billion promise, scaling up adaptation finance, new collective quantified goal on finance, and most recently, the loss and damage fund. We are yet at another COP, and I am disheartened to state that most of these commitments are yet to be fulfilled despite the urgency required to address the climate crisis. As leaders, I call for your unwavering shift in political will that will translate into concrete actions so as to confine global temperature rise within the critical threshold of 1.5 degrees Celsius. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, small island developing states are on the front line of climate change, facing rising sea levels, coastal erosion, 
increased frequency of extreme weather events, and the loss of vital ecosystems. Whether we are high income, low income, or among the least developed countries, our specificities are the same. And what the industrialized nations emit have a direct impact on our coastlines and livelihoods. We are simply islands floating in the ocean, and therefore we must be treated as a unique and separate category when it comes to assisting us. I call on SEEDS to unite and support each other. As I speak, my country is experiencing devastating impacts of climate change, specifically damage to the coastline and critical coastal infrastructure caused by higher tides, frequent storm surges, and heavy rainfall. Coupled with other impacts, these are endangering the livelihoods of my people and our islands. A recent comprehensive survey only on the main populated granitic islands of the Seychelles, conducted by our technical teams, estimated that we need over 50 million USD for road infrastructure works and other measures to mitigate coastal erosion. Our updated NDC highlighted a further 600 million USD will be required over the next 10 years for both mitigation and adaptation sector, translating to 5% of GDP annually or 10% of the annual budget. If we are to add the disaster happening to our Coraline Islands, that, that figure could be doubled, let alone tripled. Like many seeds, 90% of the country's infrastructure and human activities occur along its low-lying coastal areas and are thus vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. The current trajectory means Seychelles economy stands to be severely undermined, whereby forcing us to divert much needed finance to environment protection instead of investing in education, health, sports, agriculture, food security, modernization, and giving our people a better standard of living. Ladies and gentlemen, we made history last year by establishing the Loss and Damage Fund. And this year, we made history again by operationalizing the Loss and Damage Fund on the first day of this COP with UAE and Germany pledging $100 million each. It is absolutely vital that this fund is equitable and genuinely helpful to countries that are helping, that are experiencing climate-related disasters. It should be inclusive enough without limiting access to finance, except especially for high-income seeds like Seychelles. We need less complicated and complex financial mechanisms that will allow us SEEDS to easily access those financial opportunities. Again, my call is to consider our special circumstances as islands in the middle of oceans. Seychelles, for example, is known to be outside the cyclone belt, and we are considered high income. But when a cyclone hits neighboring Madagascar or Mauritius, the effects of adverse weather conditions affect all our islands, including our capital. In April 2016, Fantala, a Category 5 cyclone, hit one of our islands three times, destroying everything, including the communication network and homes of workers, creating two new islands in the lagoon. The resulting tsunami of the earthquake of December 2004 in Sumatra, Indonesia, thousands of miles away, traveled all the way to Seychelles, destroying human life and coastal infrastructure. My point is very simple. Don't categorize islands into economic bands, but treat all islands in the same manner and allow all of us to have access to the loss and damage fund. 
we all lose from the damage you cause. Yet, we clean up our emissions and help mop up those of industrialized nations. The current criteria used to access concessionary finance puts seeds such as Seychelles at a severe disadvantage under the current labels. There is an urgent need to reform the multilateral international financial institutions to address the restrictive conditionalities. This reform is necessary to help fund climate change projects. In other words, finance needs to be more readily available, accessible, and affordable to support these projects. As the current chair of SeedStock and the African Island States Climate Commission, my plea to COP28 is for the developed world and the multi, multi, mul, multilateral international financial institutions to have a fresh look at the seeds, which in fact are large oceanic states, and to take into account our respective particularities. Despite contributing very little to global emissions, seeds like Seychelles bear the brunt of the climate crisis. We are actively engaged in decarbonizing our energy sector, including transitioning to green mobility. Additionally, as a dedicated environment champion, Seychelles remains committed to safeguard its terrestrial and marine ecosystems. When I signed the United Nations High Seas Treaty, or the BBNG, J, earlier this year at the UN, I smiled to myself because, in a sense, Seychelles had already ratified it since we are already protecting 32% of the ocean under our care. We are protecting nearly 100% of our seagrass and that of our mangroves and another 50% of our scarce landmass. Recent sightings of blue whales in our waters after more than 60 years absence serves as evidence that our conservation efforts are creating a safe haven for marine life. The message is loud and clear. Seychelles is a committed partner that can be trusted. We believe in what we preach and we walk the talk. The evidence is there. However, we cannot do it alone. We need the financial support of the whole world to help the 100,000 people on these islands in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the metaphorical hourglass is grinding. COP28 presents a pivotal call to action to build climate resilience before the last grain of sand slips away. In unity and determination, let us seize this moment to reverse our course and forge a sustainable and resilient future for generations to come. Let's not leave anyone behind. I thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. May I remind the speaker to maintain three minutes speaking time limit? Thank you. It is my pleasure to welcome His Excellency, Mr. Recep Tajin Erdogan, President of Turkey. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Saygıdeğer devlet ve hükümet başkanları, Sayın Genel Sekreter, sizleri şahsım ve milletim adına en kalbi duygularımla selamlıyorum. Zirve toplantımızın hayırlara vesile olmasını diliyorum. Samimi misafirperverlikleri için emirlik makamlarına teşekkür ediyorum. Dünyamız koronavirüs salgını ve Ukrayna-Rusya savaşının ardından Şimdi de Gazze'deki katliamların acı sonuçlarıyla karşı karşıya bulunuyor. Türkiye tüm bu krizlerde barışın yanında olmuş, 
adalet ve hakkaniyet temelinde çözüm için çalışmıştır. İklim değişikliğine de bu perspektiften yaklaşıyoruz. Sera gazı emisyonunda tarihi sorumluluğumuz yüzde birin altında olmasına rağmen kendi imkanlarımızı kullanarak çok önemli adımlar atıyoruz. 2053 yılı itibariyle net sıfır emisyon hedefini gerçekleştirmeyi öngörüyoruz. 2030 senesine kadar emisyon azaltım hedefimizi iki katına çıkardık. Bu kapsamda yıl sonu itibariyle ise 66,6 milyon ton karbondioksit emisyon azaltımı bekliyoruz. Toplam kurulu güç içerisinde yenilenebilir enerji kaynaklarının payını yüzde 55'e yükselttik. Bu oranla Avrupa'da beşinci, dünyada ise 12. sırada yer alıyoruz. Jeotermal kurulu gücünde Avrupa'da birinci, dünyada dördüncüyüz. Hidroelektrik santrali kurulu gücünde ise Avrupa'da ikinci, dünyada dokuzuncu sıradayız. Hidrojen teknolojileri stratejimizi uygulamaya aldık. Ayrıca net sıfır emisyon hedefi bağlamında çelik, alüminyum, çimento ve gübre sektörleri karbonsuzlaşma yol haritamızı tamamladık. 2053'te yenilenebilir enerjinin payını yüzde 69'a çıkarmayı planlıyoruz. Eşimin himayesinde başlatılan sıfır atık projesiyle atıkların geri kazanım oranını 2035 yılında yüzde 60'a taşıyacağız. Tüm bu çalışmaların maliyetinin yüksekliği hepimizin malumudur. İklim finansmanı kaynaklarına ve teknoloji transferi imkanlarına daha adil şekilde erişebilmemiz bu bakımdan büyük önem arz ediyor. 6 Şubat'ta yaşadığımız deprem felaketine rağmen ne ekonomide ne de iklim değişikliğiyle mücadeledeki hedeflerimizden hiçbir zaman kopmadık. 14 milyon insanımızı ve 11 ilimizi olumsuz etkileyen depremlerin yol açtığı yaraları hamdolsun hızla sarıyoruz. Şehirlerimizin yeniden inşasında da çevreyi korumak, iklim ve çevre dostu yapılar inşa etmek önceliklerimizin başında yer almaktadır. Değerli dostlar, iklim krizi ile ilgili görüşlerimizi paylaşırken hemen yanı başımızda Filistin topraklarında yaşanan insani krize değinmeden geçemeyiz. İsrail saldırıları sonucu çoğunluğu çocuk ve kadın 16 bini aşkın Filistinli masum sivilin hayatını kaybetmesi hiçbir şekilde meşru gösterilemez. Gazze'de yaşananlar insanlık suçudur, savaş suçudur ve bu suçu işleyenlerden uluslararası hukuk önünde mutlaka hesap sorulmalı. Son gelişmelerle birlikte 1967 sınırları temelinde başkenti Doğu Kudüs olan bağımsız, egemen ve toprak bütünlüğüne haiz bir Filistin devletinin kurulmasının ehemmiyetini hep birlikte tekrar gördük. Türkiye olarak bunun tesis ve temini noktasında her türlü sorumluluğu almaya hazırız. Dünya beşten büyüktür ve daha adil bir dünya mümkündür şiarımızı burada tekrar vurgulamak istiyorum. Bu düşüncelerle sözlerime son verirken kıymetli kardeşlerim devlet başkanı Sayın Muhammed Bin Zayed ve devlet başkan yardımcısı Dubai emiri Muhammed El Maktum başta olmak üzere zirvemizin düzenlenmesinde emeği geçen herkese teşekkürlerimi sunuyorum. Hükümetler Arası İklim Değişikliği panelinin 60. oturumunu Ocak ayında İstanbul'da gerçekleştireceğiz. Ayrıca 2026 yılında düzenlenecek Birleşmiş Milletler İklim Değişikliği 31. Taraflar Konferansı'na ev sahipliği içinde adaylığımızı açıkladık. 
Siz değerli dostlarımın bu kapsamda gereken desteği vereceğinizden şüphe duymuyorum. Sizleri en derin saygıyla, sevgiyle selamlıyorum. Kalın sağlıcakla. Thank you, Your Excellency. It is my pleasure to welcome Her Excellency, Mr. Susana Kaputova, President of Slovakia. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the findings of the global stock take are clear. Humanity is marching towards the precipice. How many more climate fora do we need to avoid a free fall into it? The number of weather-related disasters almost tripled in the past four decades. Every five seconds, someone dies a premature death because of pollution. Our inaction will soon make it every four seconds. 88% of the existing disease as a result of climate change occurs in children under five years of age. How much more do we want to harm the future generations? Excellencies, decisions which can avoid the current deadly course are ours to take. The solutions are right in front of us, feasible, effective, and low-cost options are already available to mitigate the climate crisis impact. We have the technologies, resources, and skills needed. Let's use them. Our efforts must be ambitious, collective, and universal. The science is clear, our emissions must peak before 2025. Slovakia will do its fair share. Our emissions have peaked already. By 2030, they will be 55 percent less than in 1990. In the next seven years, we will invest 5 percent of our GDP from public sources to decarbonize our economy and society. At the end of this year, Slovakia is stopping the use of coal as a source of electricity. In three years, we will phase it out from heat generation. By 2030, we plan to reach 29% of renewables share in our electricity production. 85% of our electricity is already made with zero emissions. We commit to increase this to 90% by 2025. Slovakia is endorsing the Global Renewables and Energy Efficiency Pledge. Since 2015, Slovakia's green finance has grown almost fivefold, including in greener ODA and our contribution to Green Climate Fund. The loss and damage fund should help support the most vulnerable and all big emitters and economies must step in and step up. Excellencies, let's make this COP the first one, where the benefits of our concrete commitments exceed our excuses and the carbon footprint of the planes we arrived on. Thank you. I thank you, Your Excellency, for your statement. It is now my pleasure to welcome His Excellency Mr. Felipe Jacinto Nusi, President of Mozambique. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Senor President, Silencios, Minhas Senhoras e Meus Senhores, É com elevada honra e satisfação e em representação do povo e governo de Moçambique, uso a palavra nesta sessão de abertura da COP28 com o objetivo de rever o que fizemos nos últimos anos para orientarmos a nossa agenda na ação climática. 
Moçambique, apesar de contribuir com menos de 0,5% em emissões de gases de efeito estufa, está entre 10 países que sofrem dos, dos efeitos adversos de mudanças climáticas. As intempéries registradas de janeiro a março deste ano, que inclui o ciclone Fred, o mais duradouro, causou morte de 306 pessoas, afetou cerca de 1,3 milhões de pessoas e destruiu diversas infraestruturas econômicas, sociais e produtivas. Neste contexto, nós apoiamos iniciativas inovadoras de financiamento como de conversão da dívida pela ação climática e acesso ao financiamento concessional aos países em desenvolvimento. Moçambique aderiu à iniciativa africana dos mercados de carbono e iniciamos a elaboração de um plano de ativação do mercado de carbono. Estamos em negociações com alguns países para assinar um acordo de venda dos resultados de redução de emissões. Considerando o potencial que Moçambique tem a gerar créditos de carbono, principalmente nos setores florestal, agrícola, de energias renováveis, bem como na economia azul, adotamos uma regulamentação nacional para projetos de rede mais e em 2018 fomos o primeiro país a receber benefícios com a certificação de 1,9 milhão de créditos de carbono. Em termos do uso de energias renováveis para a produção de energia elétrica, em Moçambique, cerca de 70% da energia produzida vem de fontes hídricas, 14% de gás natural e 16% de restantes fontes com destaque para a energia solar. Sendo esta a primeira COP, após o Acordo de Paris, a fazer balanço global da situação em termos de mitigação das mudanças climáticas, Aproveitamos a oportunidade para instar as partes a honrarem os compromissos assumidos e apoiar os países que pouco contribuem às emissões de gases de efeito estufa, mas possuem recursos domésticos limitados para financiar a ação climática. Ainda estamos as diferentes instituições governamentais e não governamentais para aumentar o financiamento as ações de investigação e inovação tecnológica, porque com o conhecimento científico, as comunidades poderão saber como melhor se adaptar às mudanças climáticas. Silências, a diária ação climática hoje é um claro investimento na destruição de forma irreversível do nosso planeta e da humanidade. Termino convidando aos parceiros privados e públicos para se juntar a nós na viabilização da iniciativa para a gestão sustentável e integrada da floresta de Miombo, lançada com a declaração de Maputo. Esta, o Miombo, com, com os seus recursos e conhecimentos, porque a mudança climática são uma das ameaças à floresta Miombo, um ecossistema rico em biodiversidade. Estamos a agendar uma conferência internacional no próximo ano, para discutirmos sobre o miombo e assim darmos a nossa contribuição para o sequestro de carbono. E muito obrigado a todos pela atenção. Muito obrigado, Sua Excelência. É um prazer me convidar, Sua Excelência, Mr. Rashad Mohamed Ali Al Alimi, Presidente do Yemen. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Sahib al-Sumu, Sheikh Muhammad bin Zayed, Raiz Dawlat al-Imarat al-Arabiya al-Muttahida, Ashab al-Jalala wal-Fakhama wal-Sumu, Ruasa al-Dual wal-Hukumat, Sayyid Antonio Guterish, Amin Aam al-Umum al-Muttahida, Sayyid Raiz al-Mutamar al-Hubur, Jami'an. في البداية أود أن أعرج عن خالص التقدير وأصدق التهاني للأشقاء في دولة الإمارات العربية المتحدة على التنظيم والاستضافة الكريمة لهذه القمة العالمية الرفيعة والشكر موصول أيضا للأمم المتحدة 
وأمين وأمينها العام على جهوده المنسقة مع الأطراف المعنية من أجل الوصول إلى هذه المحطة الجديدة لمواجهة المخاطر المتسارعة التي تهدد حاضر ومستقبل كوكبنا السيدات والسادة منذ نحو عام التقينا على أرض مصر الكنانة من أجل الأهداف ذاتها التي تضعنا في كل مرة أمام مسؤوليات ثقيلة والتزامات حاسمة يجب الوفاء بها لحماية كوكبنا في ظل تزايد مخاطر التغيرات المناخية مع كل ارتفاع جديد في درجات الحرارة التي وصلت ذروتها القياسية هذا العام وها نحن اليوم نجتمع في رحاب مدينة دبي في دولة الإمارات العربية المتحدة التي عرفت طريقها مبكرا للتحول نحو الحيازات الخضراء بإلهام من مؤسسها الراحل الشيخ زايد بن سلطان المهيان طيب الله ثراه على أمل أن نرى تقدما حقيقيا في الجهود الجماعية لخفض الانبعاثات وبناء القدرة على التكيف وتعزيز تمويل برامج المناخ وخصوصا ذلك الموجه إلى دولنا الأقل نموا التي تزداد خسائرها عاما بعد عام أصحاب الجلالة والفخامة والسمو السيدات والسادة في الشهر الماضي شاركنا أهلنا في في محافظات المهرة وسقطرة وحضرموت أياما عصيبة في قلب أسوأ عاصفة مدارية شهدها بلدنا المنكوب بحرب الميليشيات الحوثية المدعومة من النظام الإيراني لقد جعل إعصار تيج الذي تعرضت له بلادي مدنا بأكملها معزولة عن محيطها وتسببت بأضرار جسيمة في الخدمات الأساسية كما جرفت الفيضانات حيازات زراعية واسعة ودفعت مؤقتا بآلاف السكان بعيدا عن منازلهم ليضافون إلى ملايين المشردين من بطش الميليشيات الحوثية الإرهابية على مدى السنوات العشر الماضية إن اليمن أيتها السيدات أيها السادة يواجه تحديات أمنية واقتصادية وسياسية بالغة الصعوبة جراء الحرب المستمرة التي ترفض الميليشيات الحوثية كل المبادرات لوقفها وإنهاء المعاناة الإنسانية الأسوأ في العالم وهو ما يجعل الجهد الوطني في التصدي لمخاطر التغير المناخي أمر في غاية التعقيد وفي بلادنا ساهمت الحاجة للكهرباء في ظل ظروف الحرب القاهرة إلى إطلاق جهد مجتمعي واسع للتحول نحو الطاقة الشمسية التي قد تصل قدرتها التراكمية إلى نحو 400 400 ميجا وات على مستوى البلاد وهنا يجب التوقف باعتزاز وتقدير لمساهمة شقائنا في دولة الإمارات العربية المتحدة في دعم مشاريع الطاقة المتجددة التي دخلت الحزمة الأولى منها في مدينة عدن بقدرة 120 ميجا وات على أمل زيادة هذه المشاريع إلى 1000 ميجا وات كما أننا نخطط لزراعة مليون شجرة سدر في عشر محافظات ضمن مبادرة الأمير محمد بن سلمان للشرق الأوسط الأخضر أتمنى لكم التوفيق جميعا لتحقيق كل الأهداف التي اجتمعنا من أجلها والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I thank you your excellency for your statement It is my pleasure to welcome His Excellency Dr. Haig Goffrey Diengo, President of Namibia. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you. Your Excellency, President, United Arab Emirates, Allow me to extend sincere gratitude to His Highness, President Naham, the people of the UAR, for graciously hosting the 28th United Nations Conference of Parties. I wish to commend the visionary efforts of the UAE government in championing sustainable development and environmental protection protection. The sixth report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Changes identifies Namibia as one of the most vulnerable nations in sub-Saharan Africa with rising temperatures, increased evaporation, 
rainfall variability, posing significant challenges. Therefore, for a drought-prone country like Namibia, climate change stands as a formidable obstacle to achieving the sustainable development goals. The estimated cost for implementing our nationally determined contributions is 15 billion US dollars by 2020, 2030, with 90% of it contingent on financial support from the multilateral financing windows under UN FCCC. Namibia has established a world-class blended finance infrastructure fund that is ready to receive climate financing today to facilitate necessary action in need. Our national adaptation plan is enhanced I apologize for the lack of sound in the video and maybe we can try it again. Your Highness, Excellencies, Special Event Man, Aap Sab Ka Hardik Swagat Hai. Mari Aap Se Request Hai Ka Aap Log Baithe Hai Toh Acha Rahe Ga. Pishay Log Jho Hai Unko Aap Ki Selfie Baad Me Ho Jai Ghi. Mere Brother, और यूएई के राष्ट्रपति इज हाइनेस 
शेख मोहम्मद बिन जायद के समर्थन के लिए मैं आभार व्यक्त करता हूं इतनी व्यस्तता के बीच भी उनका यहां आना हमारे साथ कुछ पल बिताना और उनका समर्थन मिलना ये अपने आप में बहुत बड़ी बात है यूए के साथ इस इवेंट को कोहस करते हुए मुझे बहुत खुशी हो रही है मैं स्वीडन के प्रधानमंत्री उल्फ कृष्ण शोन का इस इनिशिएटिव से जुड़ने के लिए भी आभार व्यक्त करता हूं फ्रेंड्स मैंने हमेशा महसूस किया है कि कार्बन क्रेडिट का दायरा बहुत ही सीमित है और ये फिलोसफी एक प्रकार से कॉमर्शियल एलिमेंट से प्रभावित है मैंने कार्बन क्रेडिट की व्यवस्था में एक सोशल रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी का जो भाव होना चाहिए उसका बहुत अभाव देखा है हमें होलिस्टिक तरीके से नई फिलोसफी पर बल देना होगा और यही ग्रीन क्रेडिट का आधार है मानव जीवन में आम तौर पर तीन प्रकार के चीजों का हम अनुभव करते हैं हमारे स्वाभाविक जीवन में भी जो लोगों को हम देखते हैं तो तीन चीजें हमारे नेचर सामने आती है एक प्रकृति यानी टेंडेंसी दूसरी विकृति और तीसरी संस्कृति एक प्रकृति है एक नेचुरल टेंडेंसी है जो कहती है कि मैं पर्यावरण का नुकसान नहीं करूंगा यह उसकी टेंडेंसी है एक विकृति है एक डिस्ट्रक्टिव माइंडसेट है जिसकी यह सोच होती है कि दुनिया का कुछ भी हो जाए भावी पीढ़ी का कुछ भी हो जाए कितना ही नुकसान हो जाए मेरा फायदा हो यानी एक विकृत मानसिकता है और एक संस्कृति है एक कल्चर है संस्कार है जो पर्यावरण की समृद्धि में अपनी समृद्धि देखता है उसको लगता है कि मैं पृथ्वी का भला करूंगा तो मेरा भी भला होगा हम विकृति को त्याग कर पर्यावरण की समृद्धि में अपनी समृद्धि की संस्कृति विकसित करेंगे तभी प्रकृति यानी पर्यावरण की रक्षा हो पाएगी जिस तरह हम अपने जीवन में हेल्थ के कार्ड को अहमियत देते हैं कि भाई आपका हेल्थ कार्ड क्या है आपका हेल्थ रिपोर्ट क्या है रेगुलर उसको हम देखते हैं हम कॉन्शियस है ये कोशिश करते हैं कि उसमें पॉजिटिव पॉइंट जुड़े हैं वैसे ही हम पर्यावरण के संदर्भ में भी सोचना शुरू करना चाहिए हमें देखना होगा कि क्या करने से पृथ्वी की हेल्थ कार्ड में पॉजिटिव पॉइंट जुड़े और यही मेरे हिसाब से ग्रीन क्रेडिट है और वही मेरी ग्रीन क्रेडिट की अवधारणा है हमें नीतियों में निर्णयों में यह सोचना होगा कि उससे पृथ्वी के हेल्थ कार्ड में ग्रीन क्रेडिट कैसे जुड़ेगा जैसे एक उदाहरण मैं देता हूं डिग्रेडेड वेस्टलैंड का है अगर हम ग्रीन क्रेडिट के कंसेप्ट से चलेंगे तो पहले डिग्रेडेड वेस्टलैंड के 
इन्वेंटरी बनाई जाएगी फिर उस भूमि का उपयोग कोई भी व्यक्ति या संस्था वॉलेंटरी प्लांटेशन के लिए करेगी और फिर इस पॉजिटिव एक्शन के लिए उस व्यक्ति या संस्था को ग्रीन क्रेडिट दिए जाएंगे ये ग्रीन क्रेडिट फ्यूचर एक्सपेंशन में मददगार होंगे और ये ट्रेडेबल भी हो सकते हैं ग्रीन क्रेडिट की पूरी प्रक्रिया डिजिटल होगी चाहे वह रजिस्ट्रेशन हो प्लांटेशन हो वेरिफिकेशन हो या फिर ग्रीन क्रेडिट जारी करने की बात हो और ये तो सिर्फ मैंने एक छोटा सा उदाहरण आपको दिया है हमें मिलकर ऐसे अनंत आइडियाज पर काम करना होगा इसलिए ही आज हम एक ग्लोबल प्लेटफॉर्म भी लॉन्च कर रहे हैं ये पोर्टल प्लांटेशन और पर्यावरण संरक्षण से संबंधित आइडियाज एक्सपेरेंसीज एंड इनोवेशन को एक जगह पर कलेक्ट करेगा और ये नॉलेज ये रिपोजिटरी वैश्विक लेवल पर पॉलिसीज प्रैक्टिसेस और ग्रीन क्रेडिट्स की ग्लोबल डिमांड को शेप करने में मदद देगी फ्रेंड्स हमारे यहां कहा जाता है कि प्रकृति रक्षति रक्षिता हा अर्थात प्रकृति उसकी रक्षा करती है जो प्रकृति की रक्षा करता है इस मंच से मैं आह्वान करता हूं कि इस इनिशिएटिव से जुड़े साथ मिलकर इस धरती के लिए अपनी भावी पीढ़ियों के लिए एक ग्रीनर क्लीनर और बेटर फ्यूचर का निर्माण करें मैं मोजाम्बिक के राष्ट्रपति का आभार व्यक्त करता हूं कि वह समय निकालकर हमारे बीच आए हैं और हमारे साथ जुड़े हैं एक बार फिर आज इस फॉरम में जुड़ने के लिए आप सभी का मैं बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद करता हूं थैंक यू ऑनरेबल प्राइम मिनिस्टर जी फॉर योर इंस्पायरिंग एंड वेरी मोटिवेटिंग वर्क्स वी रिजॉल्व टू वर्क हार्ड to take your initiative ahead in the coming days i take this opportunity also to welcome the president of mozambique his excellency mr philip nayusi i now invite his excellency ulf christiansen prime minister of sweden to deliver his remarks Thank you so much excellencies ladies and gentlemen distinguished colleagues uh, we would like to thank our hosts and dear colleagues of India for this invitation to this event on enhancing climate action indeed there are a large number of organizations corporate entities and individuals who want to contribute to securing our future environment in light of both the urgency and the opportunities of climate transition in our societies we see the green credit initiative as a promising additional tool to enhance climate action the green credit initiative could lower the thresholds and show how both companies authorities and people can take concrete action through the swedish initiative the climate leap we know that supporting action really can make a big difference since 2015 this climate leap we have financed over 5000 collected actions for climate mitigation together these actions have reduced the climate emissions with 3.3 million tons per year the cost is less than 35 us dollars per ton the largest reduction in emissions as a result of the climate leap 
are expected within transportation, waste management and biogas production, similar to the focus areas of the Green Credit Initiative. So we welcome this dialogue by India to promote global partnerships, cooperation and engagement through exchange of knowledge, experiences and best practice. We already share experiences of fruitful collaboration through Lead It, and we are looking forward to enhancing climate action together with others who also realize both urgency and possibility. We look forward to take more climate action together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Excellency, for your incisive and very encouraging words. I now invite His Excellency, Mr. Philippe Niusi, to deliver his remarks. Thank you, sorry, my dear friend and brother, Moody. You know, I'm from Gujarat. Namaste. <laughs> <laughs> Is this is Narendra Modi, Prime Minister of India, Excellencies, Heads of State and Government. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank both President Sheikh Nayan and the Prime Minister Bor Modi for inviting Mozambique to this higher level event on the Green Credit Initiative. Mozambique is very committed to protest forest ecosystem because of the benefits of to humankind. In Mozambique forest, ecosystems play a critical role for the life of our people because many of our people live in rural areas and depend on forest natural resources. Your Green Credit Initiative is aligned with Mozambique Initiative of Sustainable Management of the Miombo Forest. The Miombo Forest Initiative was formally endorsed by the Maputo Declaration last year, together signed by 11 countries in Senec region, namely Mozambique, Angola, Botswana, DRC, Congo, Malawi, Namibia, South Africa, Tanzania, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Uh, the Miombo is the largest tropical forest ecosystem, and it is home of more than 300 million population. We are here to support this Green Credit Initiative and also to ask you to accept Mozambique Initiative on the Miombo Forest as part of this large initiative by India and the United Arab Emirates. In partnership with the International Conservation Foundation, the ICCF, Mozambique will host on an international conference on the Miombo Forest next year in April in Washington, D.C to mobilize funding and international collaboration. I would like to invite Prime Minister Modi, President Nayan, and all dignitaries to join us in that conference. I'd like also to ask that the Miombo Forest Initiative be included on the Global Green Credit Web Platform that is going to be launched here in this forum. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your very insightful comments. I now invite His Excellency Charles Fouchel, President of the European Council, to deliver his remarks. My dear Prime Minister Modi, Dear President, Prime Minister, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's a great pleasure, it's an honor to be today with you. And I would like to commend the Prime Minister Modi, your personal role in chairing the G20. The G20 is an important multilateral body. We were together in your beautiful country a few months ago, and we have seen how with your leadership it is possible to make progress in the right direction. You know that the European 
European Union made a very important choice about four years ago when it decided to make Europe the first neutral continent by 2050. This is a very ambitious goal, but we made this decision because we are absolutely convinced that this is our responsibility to prepare the future, it's our responsibility to address climate change, it's our responsibility to mobilize all our efforts to make sure that we will protect the humanity. And on that point, I know that you are all of us exactly on the same page. That's why it's good to join you today to discuss this important topic of green credits, because strong climate action requires strong climate financing. And this financing will not come from one source alone. We must find new and innovative ways to mobilize more financing and to find more sources of income. And that's why I want to be very clear, we welcome this innovative initiative of our partners, because green credits are a great idea to incentivize environmental efforts. But in our opinion, we should also keep three key principles in mind to ensure they have a positive impact on climate action. The first one is the system should be robust with a high degree of integrity and transparency. Second, green credits must lead to emission reduction. And third, they cannot be cheap offset schemes that hurt the environment in the long run. And you can count on the EU to support developing countries working to decarbonize their societies we want to be a reliable and credible global partner. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to add that the European Union is fulfilling its commitment regarding the 100 billion euros needed for the developed countries. This is a promise we made many years ago, and we are fulfilling on the EU side this very important promise. Certain point, lost uh, countries supported this idea when it was put de décarbonation de 400 des plus grandes entreprises mondiales. Deuxièmement, les pays émergents doivent sortir du charbon. Et c'est le deuxième combat après celui que les pays les plus riches doivent mener. En effet, s'il y avait une priorité absolue, c'est que les émergents sortent du charbon. En effet, on doit permettre aux émergents le rattrapage économique. C'est un élément de justice. Mais ce rattrapage ne doit pas se faire sur la base d'énergie qui sont carbonées et en particulier du charbon, et pour une raison simple, c'est qu'aujourd'hui, les centrales existantes qui se concentrent largement en Asie aujourd'hui émettront à elles seules suffisamment de CO2 pour que nous excédions la cible de 1,5 degrés Celsius. Et donc, alors même que nous devrions chaque année retirer des capacités de production d'énergie basées sur le charbon, au moment où je vous parle, nous avons 500 gigawatts de nouvelles capacités de charbon qui sont en cours de planification. Et donc s'il y a une absurdité au moment où nous nous parlons, s'il y a une vraie absurdité, elle est sur le charbon. Et donc nous devons engager un virage absolu, majeur, complet sur ce sujet. D'abord, les pays du G7 doivent montrer l'exemple. Je salue mon collègue Fumio Chida qui est là et qui a eu à présider ce club, qui a été très courageux sur ce sujet. Mais les pays du G7 doivent montrer l'exemple et s'engager à mettre fin au charbon chez eux avant les autres, c'est-à-dire avant 2030. La France tiendra son engagement de sortir complètement et fermer toutes ses, en- ses centrales d'ici à 2027, c'est-à-dire sur le mandat qui est le mien. Je ne promets pas pour la suite, je promets, si je puis dire, maintenant. Ensuite, les pays les plus riches doivent aussi aider les émergents à sortir du charbon. Depuis la COP26 de Glasgow, le G7 a engagé près de 50 milliards de dollars dans des partenariats de transition énergétique juste, nos fameux jet on l'a fait avec l'Indonésie, le Vietnam, l'Afrique du Sud. Ce sont de bonnes méthodes. Il faut les poursuivre et les généraliser pour partout aider à sortir du charbon. Mais ce virage implique aussi d'être cohérent. Et on doit donc arrêter de subventionner les nouvelles centrales à charbon. Le G20 s'est engagé à Rome en 2021, mais on doit changer nos règles en matière de financement privé. Au moment où je vous parle, le secteur privé n'a aucune désincitation pour financer une centrale à charbon par rapport à du renouvelable ou autre. C'est totalement absurde. Et donc notre marché privé, notre système d'investissement dysfonctionne massivement et c'est choquant pour tout le monde. On doit donc inverser le système 
il doit y avoir dans les prochaines années un taux d'intérêt, en quelque sorte, pour le vert et un taux d'intérêt pour le brun. Et s'il y avait une priorité des financeurs, des agences de notation aujourd'hui pour être cohérents, ce serait de différencier ces taux d'intérêt qui est un vrai spread, parce qu'on n'intègre pas du tout le, le risque climatique. Et aujourd'hui, dans notre manière de noter, dans notre manière de regarder les investissements, on n'est pas du tout en train de prendre en considération qu'on continue à financer des actifs qui seront complètement dépréciés dans quelques années et qui sont incohérents avec notre stratégie mondiale. Tout ça, on va essayer de le lancer avec la Banque mondiale et nos partenaires dans le cadre de l'initiative Call Transition Accelerator demain. Troisième remarque, on doit absolument assumer de mettre la politique commerciale au service de la transition écologique. Et ça, c'est une autre aberration, très sincèrement, que je voulais mettre sur la table, parce qu'on investit aujourd'hui dans le verdissement de nos industries sur le plan national ou régional, mais on continue à libéraliser les importations de produits polluants sur le plan international comme si de rien n'était. C'est un pari perdant et c'est un pari décourageant. Et je le dis aussi très clairement, on demande beaucoup d'efforts, en Europe par exemple, pour décarboner l'industrie de l'agriculture. Si on continue à avoir les mêmes accords commerciaux que dans les années 80-90, parfois des accords commerciaux qui ont été négociés dans cette période, qui vont permettre de faire rentrer des pays dont les composants de carbone, les pratiques productives, ne font aucun effort, mais nos producteurs ne nous suivront plus. Et ils auront raison, parce qu'on est absurde. Donc on doit avoir un système qui permet d'engager tout le monde dans une stratégie. Je crois vraiment qu'on doit intégrer dans les règles de l'OMC nos règles climatiques. Il faut la faire rentrer dans le système. Et donc il faut complètement changer à cet égard et intégrer la clause climatique à l'Organisation mondiale du commerce pour aligner notre régime commercial aux accords de Paris. Et il y a quelques points très techniques mais essentiels à faire à cet égard. On doit pouvoir subventionner l'industrie verte ça peut être légitime, mais si ça correspond à un strict bénéfice climatique, et il faut que ce soit regardé par l'OMC, il faut tarifer le carbone comme le fait l'Union européenne, ce n'est pas une discrimination commerciale, mais il faut le faire de manière cohérente avec l'objectif neutralité carbone 2050. Ça ne doit pas être un instrument de blo pour bloquer le commerce, mais il faut donc que quelqu'un le vérifie. Et il faut aussi libéraliser le commerce des biens environnementaux plutôt que le commerce des biens polluants pour permettre, là aussi, que la transition énergétique et écologique se diffuse beaucoup plus vite. Quatrièmement, personne ne doit avoir à choisir entre la, pauvre, la lutte contre la pauvreté et la lutte pour le climat. Cette petite révolution, c'est celle qu'on a lancée il y a quelques mois à Paris, c'est ce pacte de Paris pour les peuples et la planète. On ne doit pas choisir entre le climat et la lutte contre la pauvreté, chacun doit choisir son chemin, il faut plus d'argent public et il faut plus mobiliser l'argent privé. On fera le point à six mois de ce pacte, et il sera publié à l'occasion de cette COP. Macky Sall va devenir donc l'envoyé spécial officiel de ce pacte avec un secrétariat assuré par l'OCDE. Mais d'ores et déjà, on a pu mobiliser beaucoup plus d'argent commun en mobilisant plus la Banque mondiale et le FMI, je les en remercie. J'invite tous ceux qui ne l'ont pas fait à redistribuer leurs droits de tirage spéciaux du FMI. D'ores et déjà, on a pu mobiliser 110 milliards de dollars qui permettent de lancer, dans 11 pays aujourd'hui, des programmes spéciaux. Et ces programmes permettent de prévenir les incidents climatiques et de lutter contre la pauvreté. Il faut généraliser cela, et c'est cet engagement de meilleure mobilisation que nous avons aussi lancé avec le Premier ministre Modi. Tout ça, plus largement, doit nous conduire à une transformation de l'architecture financière internationale qui a été pensée à une époque où beaucoup de pays qui sont présents dans cette salle n'existaient pas. Il faut donc leur redonner une voie pour que ce soit juste, pleinement inclusif, et cette transformation profonde de notre gouvernance est une priorité. Ensuite, je voulais insister sur un point, nous ne devons pas perdre de vue la nécessité de monter en puissance sur l'adaptation. L'adaptation des modèles agricoles, notamment en Afrique, est un sujet clé. La, la grande muraille verte progresse, et je m'en félicite, et nous ne, devons pas, nous ne perdons pas de vue cet engagement dans lequel nous avons mobilisé il y a un peu plus de deux ans plus de 13 milliards de dollars avec le roi Charles à l'époque et la communauté internationale. Nous avons également annoncé que nous investirions 150 millions d'euros dans le prochain cycle du Fonds international de développement agricole. Et je veux ici inviter tous les pays présents à participer en décembre à la reconstitution du FIDA, qui va jouer un rôle clé dans la réconciliation justement de l'objectif agricole et de l'objectif climatique. 
Et c'est un combat indispensable, parce qu'on ne peut pas demander aux pays africains de choisir entre le climat et la production agricole. Il faut faire les deux en même temps, avec des modèles soutenables. Et la guerre en Ukraine nous a fait toucher du doigt que le modèle n'était pas soutenable. Parce qu'on a plein de pays qui, pour que leur modèle produise, avaient besoin d'engrais azotés, d'engrais phosphatés. Donc on doit les aider à produire chez eux davantage, à avoir un modèle productif, mais beaucoup plus décarboné. Et tout ça est un élément clé. C'est dans cet agenda que nous allons aussi lancer demain avec le Kazakhstan un One Planet sur la question de l'eau qui s'organisera en septembre prochain. Je me félicite des avancées qui ont été obtenues lors de cette COP, Président, sur les pertes et préjudices. La France financera jusqu'à 100 millions d'euros euh, en fonction des éléments de gouvernance de euh, ce, ce sujet. Mais je voulais insister sur quelques points à cet égard, parce que le débat avait beaucoup monté à charmel cher sur les pertes et préjudices. Il a été beaucoup porté par mon ami Mia Motley, qui a fait un travail formidable. Mais il faut qu'on fasse attention sur ce sujet à plusieurs points. D'abord, ne confondons pas la situation des pays à revenus intermédiaires et des pays pauvres. On a besoin de ce fonds, mais il devra d'abord aller vers les pays les plus pauvres. On a surtout besoin d'une réforme en profondeur de notre système assurantiel et réassurantiel face au risque climatique. Et ça pour les pays à revenus intermédiaires qui en ont besoin. Ce fonds doit nous permettre de faire cette réforme, d'avoir un buffer, une garantie. Mais on devra avoir des mécanismes qu'il faut distinguer selon les catégories de pays. Il faut tout de suite se le dire. Il faudra une gouvernance simple et claire, lisible. Mais il faudra aussi qu'on ait une approche pays par pays. Par exemple, nous allons mettre en place un premier partenariat pays sur l'adaptation et les pertes et préjudices avec le Bangladesh. La France y investira un milliard d'euros. Donc vous voyez, beaucoup plus que ce qu'on met déjà sur le fond, parce que c'est une approche spécifique pays. On investira un milliard d'euros. Le Fonds monétaire international y ajoutera près d'un milliard et demi de dollars grâce aux droits de tirage spéciaux. Et c'est un élément clé de ce laboratoire qu'on veut faire sur les pertes et préjudices, mais il faudra une approche, là aussi, pays par pays. Au-delà de cela, il nous faut pour cela une vraie taxation internationale. Et avec la Barbade, le Kenya et plusieurs autres, nous avons lancé, et nous lançons officiellement lors de cette COP, une task force internationale qui devra justement proposer, rendre ses conclusions au G20 de Rio pour mettre en place une taxation internationale lors de la COP30. C'est une nécessité si on veut un vrai résultat, parce qu'on a besoin de lever plus d'argent pour financer notre lutte contre les inégalités et pour le climat. Enfin, le climat et la biodiversité sont indétachables. Et donc, pour cela, il nous faut insister sur le fait que nous devons continuer le combat pour la nature. Les forêts et les océans font partie de nos COP parce que ce sont des, réserves, des puits de carbone, des puits de carbone irrécupérables et un levier de solution extraordinaire pour la transition. C'est pourquoi, à l'occasion de cette COP, on va continuer la mise en place d'abord d'une technique commune, mais je veux qu'on avance et qu'on accélère sur une vraie bourse des mécanismes communs de carbone et de biodiversité. On doit aller emmener beaucoup plus d'argent privé vers les pays qui préservent leurs forêts et leurs écosystèmes. On a lancé ça à Libreville en début d'année. On va conclure avec la Papouasie-Nouvelle-Guinée, la Guinée et le Congo, les premiers, justement, packages nationaux forestiers. Et l'idée, c'est de dire on met des crédits publics et privés sur les pays qui préservent leurs forêts. Parce qu'aujourd'hui, on n'avait pas cette technique. Et donc, on met beaucoup d'argent pour faire de la reforestation. Mais tout pousse des pays pauvres ou émergents à détruire leurs forêts aujourd'hui pour financer des activités économiques beaucoup plus rentables. C'est une urgence de mettre de l'argent dans ces approches pays par pays et d'avoir une méthodologie commune. Et nous investirons 500 millions d'euros dans les quatre prochaines années dans la protection des forêts suivant cette méthode. Et puis évidemment, c'est l'océan qui est aussi une priorité. Nous aurons l'honneur d'accueillir la Conférence des Nations Unies sur l'océan en 2025. Notre ambition est d'élaborer un véritable compact pour l'océan avec du droit prescriptif, des changements internationaux très profonds pour préserver dans nos zones économiques exclusives, mais aussi au grand large, la biodiversité, pour mieux réguler justement la pêche et lutter contre la pêche illicite et réduire les pollutions en mer. Voilà les quelques éléments clés que je voulais ici apporter au débat, qui sont à la fois des solutions, des engagements de la France, et des préoccupations sur lesquelles on doit accélérer l'agenda commun. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président, pour votre attention, Mesdames et Messieurs.
I thank you, Your Excellency, for your statement. It is my pleasure to welcome His Excellency, Ms. Haga Indeitilema, the President of the Republic of Zambia. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Your Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nayan, President of the UAE, Your Excellency's Head of State and Government, Secretary General of the United Nations, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, Mr. Simon Steele, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is great, it's a great honor and privilege for me to address you all at this very important climate summit. I also wish to thank the government, the people of UAE for their hospitality to all the delegations uh, since we came here. We've all been looked after very well. Allow me to first and foremost commend your highness and the government of the UAE for all of the things that you've been doing over the years in working towards mitigating climate change. This summit, ladies and gentlemen, comes at a time when the world is recording unprecedented levels of temperatures, high temperatures all over uh, the world, and it's sending a clear message that action is needed now, in fact, yesterday and not tomorrow. We, as Africa, as Zambia, are clear that this summit comes at a time when we cannot tolerate absolutely not any lack of action or suboptimal actions at this stage. If we are to save our reform of IFI, stretching balances, conditional cap uh, raises and recycling of SDR to dramatically accelerate delivery on what they've already promised. Everyone can do more. And let's be very clear, the UK is leading the charge. We're absolutely committed to our net zero targets. We've already decarbonized faster than any other major economy. Our emissions are down 48% since 1990, compared to limited cuts from others, and a 300% increase from China. We're also one of the largest climate donors because we want to help those suffering the impacts of climate change. My pledge from September of £1.6 billion for the Green Climate Fund was the UK's biggest single climate change commitment. And we're going further, announcing £1.6 billion today for renewable energy, green innovation and forests, delivering on the historic Glasgow deal to end deforestation because we can't tackle climate change without nature. We're also leveraging the genius of the City of London to deliver billions more in private finance. Again, the UK is leading by example, and we need others to step up. Because my second message is this. As I said in September, we won't tackle climate change unless we take people with us. Climate politics is close to breaking point. The British people care about the environment they know that the costs of inaction are intolerable, but they also know that we have choices about how we act. So yes, we'll meet our targets, but we'll do it in a more pragmatic way, which doesn't burden working people. We've scrapped plans on heat pumps and energy efficiency, which would have cost families thousands of pounds. We'll help people to improve energy efficiency and cut bills, but we won't force them to. We'll support nature across the UK, just this week, I announced a huge new effort with 34 landscape recovery projects, a new national park and more. And we'll harness the opportunity of technology and green industry to deliver net zero in a way that benefits the British people. And today, I can share more proof on the progress that we're making. I'm pleased to announce a new deal between Madstar and RWE, which includes a commitment to jointly invest up to 11 billion pounds into the UK's new wind farm at Dogger Bank, which will be the biggest in the world. This is a huge boost.
for UK renewables, creating more jobs, helping to power three million homes and increasing our energy security. And by the way, this just comes days after we announced 30 billion pounds of investment at our Global Investment Summit and 21 billion pounds of investment from South Korea. We've quite frankly never seen a week like it. In Dubai today, I've also had conversations with a range of leaders, including Israel, Qatar, Egypt and Jordan about the situation in Israel and Gaza. Our position is clear and consistent. We've been categorical in our support for Israel's right to self-defense and to go after the acts of the atrocities of 7th of October, while stressing Israel, Israel's obligation to act in line with international humanitarian law. I strongly welcome the pause in fighting to get hostages out and we've been using the opportunity to get more aid into Gaza. The UK has trebled its aid, but still not enough is getting in via Rafa and other crossings. So we are actively exploring other routes, including by sea. The breakdown of the truce today is deeply disappointing, not least because a growing number of hostages were coming home. I pay tribute to the role of Qatar in helping facilitate these efforts and I hope that the process can be resumed. We want all hostages released, and in this initial phase, all women and children should be freed. I've said before that the number of civilian casualties and the scale of suffering has been far too high. So the return of hostilities is concerning to us all. We're making it clear that Israel must take maximum care to protect civilian life. We're opposed to anything that would involve the mass displacement of people we need to ensure that there are viable designated areas where safety can be guaranteed. And we need to ensure that critical infrastructure like water supplies and hospitals are protected. Again, we've been consistent with all of this. So I support the civilian protection plans outlined yesterday by the US Secretary of State. Indeed, this has been a central theme in our discussions with regional leaders here, including Israeli President Herzog. Ultimately, we will redouble our efforts to create a political horizon in which hostages are freed and security, safety and dignity is assured. We will continue to work with our partners to create a lasting peace, beginning with practical steps that address the crisis now. Thank you. Right, if we turn to some questions, can we start with the BBC? Vicky Young, BBC News. Prime Minister, no one is really disputing that the UK has done well up to this point in reducing emissions. But some of your recent announcements suggest that you feel we've done our bit for now and can leave future programme to others. Is that the case? Well, Vicky, thank you for acknowledging that we have done more than others up until now. Uh, what I can reassure you is we're going to continue to do more than others going forward too. So. Every country has something called a nationally determined contribution, an NDC, which sets out their reduction targets through to 2030. These were largely agreed at the COP that we hosted. And what are the UK's? 68%. That's our NDC in terms of our reduction. Now, I could give you a couple of others. The EU's, 55%. The US's, 40%. And I could go on and on, but you won't find another major economy that's got a more ambitious reduction target for 2030 than the UK. The other bit of good news that I can give you is that we're on track to deliver all these targets. We have already have carbon budgets that we've met and we're on track to meet the next one as well. And with all the changes that I made earlier, we're still on track to meet all of those emissions targets that I've just set out. So that's my point. We can meet targets that are already more ambitious than anyone else's, but we can do so in a more pragmatic way that saves families five, 10, 15,000 pounds. Why wouldn't you do that? is my question. I think that's the right thing to do for Britain. Demonstrate leadership on this issue, not just in the past, but in the future, but do so in a way that saves families up and down our country thousands of pounds. That seems to me to be entirely reasonable, entirely sensible, and the right thing to do for Britain. Next, can we turn to Sky? Thank you, Prime Minister. Can you honestly say hand on heart that none of the people you've spoken to today have brought up or raised any concern about the recent changes you made in green policy in the UK? Hand on heart, 100%, no. Not a single leader that I've spoken to today has spoken about that. 
Do you know why? Because most of their targets are less ambitious than the UK's. Just take one example, the phase out of petrol cars, of ICE vehicles, right? Well, we previously had a date that was 2030. What did I do that was apparently so dramatic? I changed it to 2035. You know why no one's raised it with me? It's because basically every other country in the world is using 2035 as their target. France, Spain, Italy, Germany, Australia, Sweden, multiple states in America, Canada. That's why, because what we're doing is eminently reasonable and we've done more than everyone else. And actually what everyone's spoken to me about today is how the UK is playing a leadership role. They're grateful to us, not just for the leadership that we've shown in reducing emissions, but for the actual practical support we're providing them. The 1.6 billion pounds that I announced today is gonna to do enormous good in lots of different countries around the world, helping them make that transition, investing in cleaner fuels, in research and development, being innovative with climate finance products that they will need to use, helping to restore their forests. That's what they've all been talking to me about today. And they're actually enormously appreciative of all our efforts and are keen for us to keep doing what we're doing. So that's the tenor of the conversations I've had today. And I can give you that, so that one example on a phase out date for electric cars, I think that's just how distorted this debate has become. I, I shift a date to be in line with basically every other country and it's somehow portrayed as some extreme measure. I think that just tells you that this debate has been polarized by extremes and that's not healthy or good for the country. Next, GB News. Prime Minister Christopher Hope from GB News. Of the £1.6 billion announced for climate change finance today, more than £800 million is beyond what you pledged before. How can you afford this, given the cost of living crisis at home? Wouldn't money be better off, better off spent on people at home, not, not doing more to divert your signal on the, on the global stage? Well, look, remember, we have a statutory commitment in legislation to spend 0.7% of our GDP on aid. When I was Chancellor, precisely because I thought that it was right that we prioritised the situation at home, given that we've just been through a pandemic at the time, and everyone could see that the damage that had done to our economy, the impact on the tax burden, uh, I thought it was a sensible decision to come off that target. And that's what I did. Again, I got an enormous amount of criticism for that at the time, uh, but I thought that was the right thing to do. Re reducing our age budget temporarily whilst we're going through this period where we need to restore the public finances in the wake of not just a once in a century pandemic but a, now an energy crisis i thought that was a reasonable thing to do of course we care about our obligations to the most vulnerable people around the world we're a compassionate country we always have been and we will continue so i care deeply about that and i think actually everybody does but they do also think that there's a limit particularly when things are difficult at home and the tax burden has had to go up to deal with COVID and an energy crisis, I think there's a sensible balance to be struck. And again, the measure that I took that was you know, widely criticised by lots of people is one that I believe the British public entirely support, because I think that is the right priority. And it shows that you can do both. We can be pragmatic about our approach to helping everyone and still, by the way, be a world leader, but also make sure we prioritise the needs of people at home. That's the balance that I've struck. That's what I will do as Prime Minister. And again, both the aid decision and the net zero decision, I think, show that attitude uh, making it, no, well, making it actually people at home. Next, Telegraph. Thanks, Prime Minister. Dominic Penner here on the Telegraph. Um, neither President Biden nor President Xi are here today um, or at the COP conference, the two largest emitters. Are you worried that if the likes of China and the US don't reduce their emissions, the efforts made in the UK by your government could pale into insignificance? Yeah. I think the broader point I'd make is and the UK accounts for less than 1% of global emissions, right? I mean, so that is just the reality of it. So all of us who believe in climate change want to make sure that we leave our planet in a better shape for our kids and our grandkids. have to acknowledge that, you know, in reality, you know, what we do isn't going to be the difference in terms of our emissions. Now, of course, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do anything. Of course, we've got responsibility to act. We've got to demonstrate. We've got to lead by example. That's what we're doing. Uh, but you're right to say that from a kind of practical scientific perspective clearly it's the large emitters that have to bring down their emissions reductions and we can help with that right so lots of the conversations that i've been having today are about look, how do we leverage what we're doing in our country to help others around the world whether it's halting offshore wind technology and i'm going to just point you back to the deal that we announced today 
a massive, massive investment in UK offshore wind from the UAE. Why? Because we're a leader in it, and that expertise can now be exported around the world and help others make that transition. Uh, but also in climate finance, and I'll go back to I know it's a bit techy, but fundamentally, there is no way to solve this problem especially for large emitters in, in developing countries without providing them with finance. And that means a reform of the global financial system. Things like the World Bank, the IMF need to be reformed. Their balance sheets need to be stretched. That work is happening and we've been a champion of it. We need to change how we approach lending to these countries, pioneering the use of Brazilian debt clauses, for example. Again, that's something that I've been talking to people about. So look, that's how we can help large emitters. It's leveraging the expertise that we have in technology, also the City of London, UK financial services, um, and R&D. Like, those are all the ways that we can help large emitters bring down their emissions, as well as leading by example. But you are right that ultimately, with less than 1% of emissions, we've got to have other people step up to the plate as well, which is, again, why I think it's entirely reasonable, going back to the first question, that we can do this in a pragmatic, proportionate way. And again, with doing more than everyone else, we can do it in a way that saves people money. And by the way, we're only account for 1% of emissions. Seems to be the right approach. Uh, next, uh, the I. Thank you, Prime Minister. Hugo Jai from the I. Um, among the many people you've spoken to here today are Paul Kagame, the President of Kenya, and Tony Blair. Can you tell us what you talked about with both Paul Kagame and Tony Blair? So uh, it was uh, nice to see Tony Blair, who obviously got an enormous amount of experience of the Middle East. So it was good to catch up with him very briefly on that. Uh, look, Paul Kagame is obviously we have a deep uh, partnership with Rwanda, which he's committed to, as am I. And we're both committed to making it work. I was able to catch up with him uh, on what I spoke to you about yesterday, which was that we're finalizing the arrangements we have with them. It was good to check in with him on that and reiterate both of our commitment to partnership work. Paul and I you know, have, have forged a very strong relationship over this issue. He's keen to work very constructively with us. We're keen to work very constructively with them. This is such a vital issue for the UK, so it's important that we get the details of all of this right, uh, but that's what we're doing. We're in the process of finalising it, and I look forward to bringing these proposals before Parliament and the British public soon, and you know, they will make it crystal clear that Rwanda is a safe country for the purposes of our scheme and Parliament will have the chance to affirm that, and that will ensure that there should be no more blocks in our domestic courts to operationalizing this scheme. But I've also said that I wouldn't have a foreign court stand in the way of us or prevent us from getting a flight off uh, when, the time, when the time comes. And I'm confident that we now have the proposals in place, and as I said, we're in the process of finalizing those. But yeah, it's been, that's the opportunity of being here, is having a number of very positive conversations with people on a range of different topics. Uh, and then lastly, can we go to Politico? Uh, Prime Minister, if you can hear me over the background noise. Um, the King has been here for two days. Uh, other world leaders are staying into the weekend. You've been here a matter of hours. You're due to leave again imminently. Uh, you'll have spent more time on the private plane than on the ground at the summit. Um, are you really taking COP28 seriously? And what's so pressing that you need to leave so soon? So, again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't measure our impact here by hours spent. I would measure it by the actual things that we're doing that are making a difference. And you know, as I said, the conversations that I've been having with people are incredibly positive, right? So one of the most productive set of discussions I've had today with Ajay Banga, the president of the World Bank, uh, Kristalina Georgieva, the president of the IMF, where you know, we, I participated in a panel discussion with Kristalina and we were speaking separately, is about this very significant reform of the global financial system architecture that needs to happen. It's about you know, climate resilient clauses being used. It's about reform of IFI, stretching balance sheets, conditional cap. Uh, raises and recycling of SDRs, like, all of that is incredibly impactful to literally hundreds of millions of people around the world. Like, because of those conversations, you know, what will happen as a result of those? And we led those conversations. I started that as Chancellor and having the opportunity to further those conversations, move the conversation on, will ultimately lead to outcomes which which we're starting to see. We just had an announcement today about another country using one of these clauses. Um, and you know, we pioneered the way on recycling SDRs. Now we're talking about deploying that money to help countries around the world in just energy transition partnerships, for example, in Vietnam. But that's the impact we're having, right? And it's not measured in how many hours we're here. This is just one aspect of it. These conversations have been going on for years. We've been leading them. I've been participating 
in them. And I'm actually very confident that what we've achieved here is significant. You know, we sat at our stall, demonstrated our, I think, both moral and practical leadership on this issue and furthered the agenda in ways that we can make a difference. Loss and damage being uh, another example where I'm already talking to people about the structure of how the loss and damage fund will be deployed. That will be uh, a point which we will have to, to work through as we talked about also doing things that are great for the UK, securing over 10 billion pounds investment in what will be the largest off farm that we have that's gonna power millions of homes with clean energy secure uh, in the UK is a massively positive outcome for the UK. That's, that's jobs, energy security and cheaper energy as a result of the conversations and the work that's been happening. So look, I feel very good that this has been a very productive day, but it's not the only day that we focus on tackling climate change. Just this week, we announced, I think, an incredible package of measures to restore, protect, and enhance our natural environment at home. A new national forest, a new national park, two new community forests, improving access to nature for children across the country, protected landscapes and protected ecosystems like temperate rainforests that we have in the UK, which are incredibly precious. We've been working on these for a while, right? These, and again, we're doing that internationally here, right? We pioneered the interaction between nature and climate change. What do we announce today? Half pounds in forestry support to make sure that forest landscapes are sustainable. We protect that biodiversity. Uh, and everyone's incredibly excited about it, right? Like we are leaders in that space and um, you know i've been able to talk to people about what we can do for them how we're going to partner with them and that will lead to many more positive things in the future so look again i think it is it's hugely simplistic to measure the impact of our uh, of our presence here by the hours we spend you should be saying to me you could be here for three days but that would mean nothing if i hadn't come home with 10 billion pounds of investment in an offshore wind farm creating jobs and providing clean energy or if i haven't been able to announce you know, more money for climate finance in ways that other countries like uh, and it's going to make a difference to them or progress conversations on reforming the global financial system which is ultimately going to benefit dozens of countries and hundreds of millions of people I, that's a record that everyone should be incredibly proud of right i mean there's nothing to political here everyone should stand tall when it comes to the uk and climate change we are more than doing our bit we are leading the conversation and the other thing that i have achieved in my time here which we we haven't spoken about obviously a lot in the q a is a very substantive set of of discussions on the Middle East, right? The situation is, of course, incredibly concerning. Uh, you know, what we're seeing, the suffering we've seen um, is something that will make all of us, uh, I think, be sad and upset about things. And we all want to find a way to alleviate the suffering, which is why the breakdown of the temporary humanitarian pause has been disappointing. You know, and I had very productive conversations with the leaders of, as I said, Israel, Jordan, Egypt uh, and Qatar, uh, talking about how we can get more aid in, how can we restart the hostage process, what's the future that we can bring to the people of Gaza so that they can live with dignity and security. You know, those are all incredibly important conversations uh, which have all happened today. And again, they're very grateful for the role that the UK is playing in that situation. We've been one of the leaders in providing aid into the region, not just money, but practical support on the ground, because a lot of this is logistical challenges. That's what I've been talking to people about today. How do we alleviate the logistical challenges, which mean that not enough aid is currently getting in? I talked about whether we can find alternative routes, maybe by sea, where we can play a role. So there's, again, a whole host of things that we've made progress on today that I think will, again, make a difference. And my conversations that I've had with everyone, all I've heard is appreciation for what the UK is doing and uh, an acknowledgement that on all these issues, we're leading the global conversation. So I think it's been a, a very productive day's work, but you know I've got to get back and focus on other things too, and I'll get back to work and do that tomorrow. Thank you very much. Nice to see you.